This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. All right, so Annex slams the G-bike into high gear, trying to escape the guards. Slam Dex is going to hold on tight. Uh, it took us so long to get the code box, I don't want to drop it. Okay, there are three ex-mercenaries on Nazgard bikes in hot pursuit. Okay, so even with Slam Dance on the back, I only got a minus one of the roll, so I've got a ten. Nice. All right, cool. Um, you pull ahead, losing core sec in the oncoming traffic. So you're like you're weaving in between traffic. It's it's like real Jason Bourne shit, right? Like just no, no, no. All right, and you just got like a few more blocks before you reach a Luminary Tower. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to a Luminary Tower. Jerry and I talked about this last week. We think our best bet is to grab a hyper shuttle to Venus. We can always sell the info to Metal Fire once we get someplace safe. True. Oh, n- neither of us really like Dr. Clavis enough to risk going to Luminary Tower. Besides, once Metal Fire gets the info we stole, Nazgar won't be able to use it. Uh, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, I mean, I thought you guys wanted to do the heist of the Luminary Tower. Like, that. that's kind of what we planned for this week, right? When we ended last session, I was like, hey, what do you guys want to do? And you were like, a Luminary Tower. I mean, we like heists, but going to Venus makes more sense. It really does. Uh, but we can do a heist if that's what you're ready. No, no. You want Venus. You're getting Venus. Besides, you know me. Never unprepared. And with that, welcome to the episode 405 of the Misdirected Mark podcast. Tonight we'll be discussing prep and improv, and then we'll slide over to the conversation corner for a look into what else has been going on in our lives. But first, my name is Jerry. My name is Phil. And I am Old Man Logan. Are we sure this is episode 405? Yes. I'm like yes. almost 100% sure because last time was 404. Yeah. Okay. I know yeah. Rob made a joke about 404 when he was putting the yeah. stuff that together. Was last I thought that was a great opportunity. I thought that was <laughs> yeah. two weeks ago. Uh, no, that was two weeks ago in, in pandemic time. <sighs> Forget it. Never mind, man. I can't tell. I can't tell weeks. 405 it is. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, before we enter the house misdirected, um, as uh, as per the um, network protocols, we have to do our temperature check. Uh, so how are we feeling mentally and physically, Bob? Yeah, so physically, uh, not too bad. Um, my sinuses have been doing something weird all day. Um, it's been kind of just annoying. Um, but otherwise, physically feeling pretty good. A um, little tired this morning, but most of I got a nap in today, so I'm uh feeling pretty good there. Mentally, um about as good as normal. Today I'm I'm feeling it a little bit because there was a um there was a bit of news that came out from the hockey world that kinda hit me. I I've currently got a thing going with uh with mortality. Um and I found out that Dale Howarchuk, a hockey player who used to play for the Sabres back in the day, who I remember very fondly, he passed away. From cancer, 57, 57 years old. So Saw that's kind news. of been that's kind of been pulling Pretty at my sucky. gut today. So yeah, I just no, like I to remember. state for the record: fuck cancer. Um, as always, as a uh, yeah. that is a that is a um, that is a channel directive. Yeah, at all times. But other than that, yeah. All right, welcome in, welcome yeah. in, Jer. How you doing physically? How you doing mentally? Physically doing pretty good. I'm a little, little full. I had a half a calzone from Macy's place today, so I'm full of the <laughs> C word. Uh, but no, I'm doing pretty well. I'm taking my uh, online. I'm taking my uh, stay at home online class this week. So uh, it's been long, long days because they they crank us in there for nine hours every day. So uh, it's been good. So already welcome. How, how are you doing? Uh, you know, actually, I am doing pretty well. Uh, physically, I actually feel better than, um, uh, I feel better than I have in quite some time. I spent, uh, this entire week, uh, bike riding just a little every day, but except for yesterday when it was really raining, um, I've been out on my bike, uh, every day during the week and, uh, my stamina is picking up. Like I'm, I'm getting, I'm starting to ride longer and longer distances. It's still nothing impressive yet compared to people who like ride bikes. Um, but, um, it's getting there. This is an and 
This isn't a contest, though. That's okay. No, no, it's not. It's not. But like, you know, I have my my Fitbit, you know, measures my heart rate. And so like, you know, like today I went on a ride and I came back and my heart rate was like significantly lower than it was like a, a week ago making a much smaller ride, which tells me now I can up my distance. Like I clearly wasn't, I clearly wasn't huffing and puffing enough at the end of the ride. So now I'm going to bump the distance out. Yeah. You're getting your bike legs under you. Yeah. Well, I'm much more, we'll talk about it in the conversation quarter, but I'm like much more confident on my bike than I was last week when I started riding it. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the other thing is like all the back, like the muscle soreness in my back and like lower back and stuff like that's like all gone now. And I, know, I think it's just from like moving around and just being like up on the bike and like, you know, like doing stuff. So I feel like I feel pretty good mentally. I thought I was going to have a crappy day. I was ready to start fighting with my bosses before I had my first cup of coffee, which is Saw bad. Yeah. Uh, but I managed to kind of hold my self together, like whatever buffer I had held and uh, I made it through the day. I did take my bike ride, but right before lunch, like I was getting tired and I was like, oh, I should take a nap before lunch. And I was like, yeah, screw it. You know what? I'm going to get on my bike and go take a ride. So I took a ride and I came back uh, for lunch. So I feel like I guess I'm good. So I'm coming in too. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, Let's kick over to one thing. Just one thing going in our lives right now. Uh, Jer, what do you got going on? Uh, this week, Lily and I put together some new kitchen shelving, just some stuff, uh, more like kitchen racks than anything else, but um, uh, ended up with enough space to replace a very tiny shelf we had in the corner that was a little, like, 12-inch by 4-inch and three racks high, and we got a 5-foot-tall, 6-shelf, uh, 24 by 14 set, and that enabled us to get a lot of stuff just out of cupboards and... Um, move some of the stuff that was, uh, including some of the, like the Cuisinart and that kind of stuff up on the higher shelves. And what it did is it cleaned up the kitchen and um, got stuff that was buried in cupboards out where we can see it again. And so it's made it a lot easier to cook. It's made it a lot easier to keep clean and just made the kitchen a more workable space. And uh, to people who do this all the time, I'm sure this is not a, a new thing for them, but to me, it just, it really just was very soothing. It only took about an hour to do it. Um, but we overhauled a big chunk of the kitchen, just moving things around and getting stuff out and um, <laughs> throwing out a few things that we looked at. We're like, yeah, um, the due date on this, this expired before you and I got married. And she's like, yeah, we should probably throw that one out. So that uh, happens when you hide it in the back of a closet. Exactly, exactly. Expired, um, expired, expired. And and then and then Lily turned around and, and made uh, banana bread, which she cooked while I was trying to game in here. And so I'm trying to run my game on Sunday. And, mm. So that all kind of all piled together. Bob, how about you? Yeah, so uh, along a similar theme, um, last week uh, I received the new microwave and the new microwave shelf. Um, technically, the new microwave shelf that I ordered um was delayed a day and I realized that I had measured it wrong and it wasn't going to work. Um, <laughs> so I quick ran out and I bought one, ran into target and took care of that. Um, but I got the new microwave and, and got them whole microwave area cleaned up and organized and everything. So looking pretty good. And, uh, I'm feeling good about the, uh, the organization thing. Organization's always good. Yep. It's, uh, for me, it's a form of control. So, uh, it has the added benefit of not only being organized, but it makes me feel in control of stuff. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. that, that's exactly it. When things are in their place and you can see them, um, you, you're kind of master of your own domain in a way. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I myself, um, this week, uh, ran our first Numenera session. Mm, cool. Uh, which I, you know, I had a lot of fun. We, um, I don't know. I, 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 at some point, not now in the opening, but, my um it was like very interesting lately kind of rolling uh g m style uh normally you know normally I'm a big get to the fucking monkey guy and mm -hmm. uh um you know aggressive scene cutting or whatever but I, like I haven't been doing it for the last couple games, 
And I, I'm not regretting it. Like we did the, our Numenera warm up. We, we did some character questions because I wanted to know a few more things about um, characters. And then I was like, cool, let's just, I'm going to do something very apocalypse world, which yeah. is um, you wake up at, you wake up in the morning. Like, what do you, what do you do? And we just did like a little like walkabout switching between um, it was just Glenn and um, and Bob on Sunday. So we just switched between characters and just kind of learned a little bit more about like, you know, what does their house look like in the morning and who do they live with and all of that. And it was just I don't know. It was good. Like it was um, it helped make everything feel a little more real. Yeah. Uh, and then we eased into the story. Like I, I found a natural, based on the character questions, I found like a really natural connection point for how to um, hand off the plot to the players. Um, and then, you know, in return, they did a really nice job of um, recognizing said plot, um, accepting it and, you know, getting ready to move into it. So yeah, we just like, we just had this nice, um, this nice easing into the game. Um which I like. And, you know, I didn't want to get too far in because we also have to catch uh, Tony up when yeah. he's back, which uh, we're in a really good place to have Tony kind of run up and catch up to everybody before um, they head off into the mountains. So um, that, that, just, that, that just sounds like something out of like an intervention or therapy. I recognize your plot tops and I accept it. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, considering tonight's topic. You know, we've done, I know on Pandas, we've done the other side of, you know, this kind of discussion where we've, you know, yep. we've done a whole Pandas episode about, you know, it, as players, like, learn to accept, like, accept the plot. Yep. Um, and so um, it was a very nice, it was very smooth. And then, so we got started. Anyway, that's my... Um, that's good. My, I, I'm just really enjoying Numenera, I guess, is the the way to put it. I've been enjoying reading about it. Um, I'm going to read a couple of the supplements. I'm going to go buy the... Um, uh, the Destiny book shortly, because I think that's the game we really want to play is Numenera Destiny, which is um, the rules that include like building up towns and things like that. So that's cool. Yeah, I think that's that's I think I think that's where we're heading. I think everybody yeah. would very much like to get into that. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that shortly um, so that I, I, I'm going to go buy the Dead Tree book so I can um, I can start reading it anyway. Love and Numenera. There we go. Uh, awesome. Moving into announcements. Yeah. Uh, cool. If you are watching live tonight, is the TNG watch party finale? All dun, dun, good dun. things. Uh, it is the only thing we're watching. The uh, TNG uh, watch club concludes tonight. Uh, there have been a number of people who have made it through the twelve week uh, TNG crash course. Yep. Uh, and um, I thank all of them for kind of coming <coughs> on this journey. It was actually a lot of fun for me to curate the episodes and then to uh, post them and kind of talk about what was interesting about them and hear like um, what everyone's thoughts. And to give you an idea, we did, I think we did like 63 of the 170 something episodes. It comes out to about 39% of the series. So uh, if you're, if you enjoyed that, um, if you enjoyed that, you have a lot more of the series that you can um, you can actually go back and now uh, watch and enjoy um, because you'll have a really good base understanding, I think, of the you know of the series. There's a few of the uh, additional episodes that I think I want to catch up catch up with um, that I didn't see back when we were watching, so I was trying to catch up every week. So this week, with no homework episodes to watch, it'll be good to catch up on. I want to yeah. see the one. I want to see the one where Worf, Worf takes his son to the Klingon planet for trials and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You should definitely go back and catch a few episodes. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you can always post in the always post in the forums. Uh, which now brings us to next week. Uh, so yeah. next week, I believe that's the twenty fourth. Am I correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So next week. Uh, August 24th. 25th, uh, sorry. 20, 25th, yeah. Sorry, 25th. We are going to kick off the DS9 Watch Club, Oot. starting with the DS9 Watch Party, which will be the uh, Emissary episode, which is a two-part episode okay. um, that will introduce the series. And we are going to do the exact same thing as before. Uh, we're going to have uh, watch. We're going to have watch clubs on Tuesday nights with um, homework episodes to watch during the week. Um, let me say 
that this list is way more robust. It is so stupid big. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to I was able to crush TNG into 39% of the episodes to make uh, an, a crash course. When I went through, and I did this on Saturday night, I went through every season of DS9, spot checked every episode, looked them up to make sure I remembered every episode. When I honed the list, it is 136 episodes out of 176 episodes. We are watching 77% of Deep Space Nine. That was that was all I could get rid of. And I'll be honest, most of it show. is seasons one and two. Um, but uh, we are not... So not only do we need to watch all of the DS9 episodes, but part of your homework, uh, and I think one of the watch parties, is going to include one uh, TNG episode and two old series episodes that need to be watched as background yeah. in order to in order to understand episodes in deep space nine so you know, you know when when you're finally done with the voyager watch party we should do a uh old series we should do space we should do space seed and wrath of khan oh mm. <laughs> Love, I, I i will watch wrath of khan with anyone anytime yes uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, so um, let me just say this. The current projection for Deep Space Nine's watch party, we will be done the first week of February 2021. <laughs> uh, what a great, what a great run it's going to be. It is, it is going to be a long haul. And I can also say this. There are some weeks where there's only going to be like two episodes for homework. Because there are no extra episodes between the kick-ass episode I want to watch for the watch party mm -hmm. and the next kick-ass episode I want to watch for the watch party. Yeah. So there are yeah. some weeks where it's literally going to be like we're, watch we're doing the watch party and then there's two episodes and then that's it for the week. So yeah. it, it may in some cases be lighter than some of the, you know, like than TNG. Uh, especially as we get later in the series, like later in the series, there are like so few episodes we can afford to miss that um, we'll just be kind of stuttering our way through like Excuse season me. six and seven. But I went back and um, I just went back through it. It was like it was having just watched it and I went back and like curated the list. And, I, you know, I, I start by compiling other people's lists. And then I'm going through it, and I'm like, how is this episode not in anyone's list? I'm like, stick it back in there. Like, <laughs> nope, that's got to be in there. That All one's right. paid. This is a payoff from a previous season. Anyway. Anyway, that's kicking, the, that's kicking off next week. So if you are listening to the recording of this episode, uh, then it would be today. It will be the start of the DS9 Watch Party. The forum uh, topic is up. This weekend, I'm going to go in and put the watch list and all of that stuff. I'm going to do like the intro message, the watch list, and all that are going to go in. Um, are going to go in sometime this weekend. So get ready. Um, get ready because we're we're getting started. All right. And speaking of getting ready, no. Oh yes, please. All right. Phil's got to do his thing. Gotta do my thing. Gotta earn. Gotta earn my keep tonight. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Workshop. Workshop. We're talking about prep. We're talking about improv. Do you prepare it? Do you just make it up on the fly? Do you do both? Do you do neither? I don't know. You gotta do something. You gotta make this game great. Prep it. Improv it. Do it. Workshop. Don't suck. Don't suck. All right. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, let me take my sip. I forgot I'm the opening on this one. <clears throat> All right. Today's um, topic, or this week's topic, uh, comes out of Twitter, uh, a place I still sometimes frequent when my mental health is uh, good enough. <laughs> um, so occasionally, I see this meme, this RPG meme go by that I always think is funny, right? Like, I just, it's, I think it's funny because it always reminds me of, like, when I was a much younger gamer. Uh, like 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 eighties gamer Phil, uh, and the meme always goes a little something like this. All right, so I spent a week preparing a badass dungeon, but the players decided to build a cobalt orphanage right in the middle of town instead. Right, and and the you know the 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 comment on the meme was like somebody like took the meme and like commented on it on Twitter and was like, "You're you're like 
this GM's playing D and D wrong. And I was like, mm. like <laughs> this is ruffling my feathers um, because it implies that prepping games is a quote wrong way to play a game. And that quote, the only true way is to improv your games. <laughs> and first of all, none of like, I don't buy into any of that bullshit that gets under my skin for a lot of reasons. So I put out a, like a tweet, I put out a like five or six tweets about it, but uh, Twitter sucks for having any kind of um, lengthy discourse. And we have a podcast. So I hijacked this week's topic to talk about uh, exactly this. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about prep and improv. We're going to talk about the strengths of both of them. Now you can use both of them in your game. All right. But to get into this, as usual, we need to define some things. <laughs> so... Behold! You are in the presence of Definition Panda. Yep. Yes. Phil, what do we need to know? All right. I, this, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. We're going to be talking about two major topics tonight. We're going to be talking about prep, right? The work that you do before the session to be prepared to run the session. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, improv, short for improvising, right? Which is to create and perform spontaneously without preparation. So this is the, um, these are the two sides of the same coin, right? Prep, improv. And um, in RPGs, there are two stereotypes when it comes to these words. People also with the prep GM is someone who spends hours writing notes and maps planning things out, getting everything all put together in lines and, 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 and lines and charts just in order to run their game. And it sometimes implies the GM would want to railroad the players into what they have planned and nothing else. Uh, but we're not going to be dealing with railroading tonight. Just talking about the prep GM is somebody who takes all that time to prep long before the game starts. Yeah, yeah. Railroading is like it's literally its own yeah. topic and its own problem. And let me be clear, you don't need to prep to railroad anyone. You that can railroad true. somebody with improv. Um, improv does not make you immune to railroading. Anyway, whole separate topic. Okay, the improv, so that's the stereotype, right? The prep GM is like feverishly working on their notes all the time. Uh, it, compared to the stereotype of the improv GM who like shows up to the game with like an index card with three bullets on it that they filled out in traffic like five minutes before they got to the game. And that using this index card, they will magically create like the best game that you've ever had, you know, out of thin air. And also, it's a stereotype. <laughs> yes, very much so. Uh, because there are, I mean, there are both these people exist somewhere out there in the world. There is the GM who rigidly prepares everything and that's it. And there's the GM who comes to the game with very little idea what they're going to be doing. Uh, just kind of improv the entire thing. But the truth is, most GMs out there are neither of these extremes. The truth is that most of us fall somewhere in between these two poles. Um, that improv GMs are going to prep on some level. And GMs that prep a lot will also improv once the game gets going. Exactly. All right. So tonight we're not praising or demonizing either one of these approaches. Right. Uh, rather, we're going to look at these for exactly what they are. They're tools. And they're tools that should be used by a GM to get the job done. Cool. So let's start with prep. What does prep do? Sure. So prep prepares the GM for the upcoming game. Right. So it is uh, it is a skill. Right. Meaning that it is something that we can improve upon with practice. Um, usually when you are not skilled in prep, um, it could mean a couple things. Right. So it could mean that it takes you a long time to prepare. Um, it could mean that you're preparing way more than you actually need. Um, or it could mean you're you're preparing things. So it could mean you're preparing way more content that you need. Or it could be that you're preparing details, that more details than you need. And when you're skilled at this, it means that you can prep kind of efficiently. Um, you're prepping like really only what you need. And you're prepping it for like the appropriate amount of game time uh, that you're, you know, that you're going to run. 
And, and prep has a bunch of advantages uh, to it. The first thing it does is it gives the GM uh, some thought and ideas, locations, NPCs, areas where the plot's going to occur, uh, some some hooks that they're going to be able to show up to all the players and give them something concrete to work with that the GM isn't going to have to worry about coming up with at the last minute. Yeah. Um, it allows for some sort of, um, basically some sort of framework for the rest of the game to hang on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it prepares you, right? So it like loads you up. Um, it requires less cognitive load at the table since, as Jerry said, all those things that, that Jerry named, um, you did prior to coming to the game, right? Those are in your notes. And this is really good um, in terms of allowing GMs who need to focus on other things to put their energy in those things and not have to also be synthesizing all of their stuff um, while they're, uh, which while they're, you know, while they're running the game. Uh, and this can be really good if you're a new GM, right? Like, you know, Send and I make this joke on pandas all the time that there's like eight skills that a GM has to do. Uh, improv is one of those skills. And so if you have prepped some stuff, that's a thing you can actually, um, you can actually slide over and work on other things like reading the table or, you know, working on your voices or your presentation, things like that. Um, it's good if you're learning a new system, right? So if you're learning, especially if your system's crunchy um, or it's just, you know, it's new and you've just never run the game before, um, having to not synthesize the game while you're also looking up rules or trying to figure out how to, you know, get the gears turning on it, that's helpful as well. I say it does is it doesn't rely on input from the players um, to keep the game moving. But as a GM, it can also be laid out specifically to give them places for input. Mm -hmm. If you're a GM who likes to give the players some input, you can decide, okay, they're going to go into this town, they're going to go to a bar, this is the bar they're going to, and then once they're in the bar, I'm going to have these two characters give them some information, and then I'm going to have spots open, I'm going to ask the players who else is in the bar to give them some room to work with as well. And if you've got that framework set up ahead of time, it makes it easier to, later on, impro improv as well, because you've got the things you need and still are setting up spaces specifically for the players to take the raids as well. So it does yeah. both. And, and, the, and I know that some people will be like, it's an advantage it doesn't take input from the players, but hear me out. Mm -hmm. when, when I wrote this, I, I, had a, I, I had something in mind, right? Yeah. You know, like some nights, your players are tapped out of ideas. Yep. Right? Like some nights you come in, and your players are like, got, all, got our asses kicked at work, so what do you got, right? And they may not be in the best headspace to be improv -ing. So in this case, having some stuff prepped is like, cool, we're going to start doing this. And, you know, they can just kind of like ease in and either the, you know, ease in and just use what you got, or maybe they'll ease in and then start, you know, like they'll, they'll kick into their improv mode. But, it, you know, it helps. Um, when you have stuff prepped, when your players aren't feeding you stuff that you need. And it's also a way to, um, if you've got a long going story, it's you, you don't necessarily want that input for the players until after you get whatever the hell it is you're trying to get moving this week going. Yeah, that's true. If you've got it laid out, then you can do that. And, and you don't, you sometimes don't need that input from the players to get the story going. Yep. At least I initially. Agree. All right, what's next? Uh, yeah, so prep handles information and plot continuity better. Mm -hmm. uh, so th things like mysteries and conspiracies work a lot better if you do a little prep. Um, it's not to say that you can't improv mysteries. And many, many um, episodes ago, uh, we did a past show where, where, where Chris and I talked about this. But improv mysteries and planned mysteries uh, come out very different. Yes. So. Uh, prep really does benefit um, mysteries and conspiracies. It also allows for more complicated sessions with things like set piece encounters, complicated terrain, um, multiple props and the like, hard recipes, because it gives you time to think them out and you can also package them up for the game. Um, if you're deciding that you're going to have, if you're playing a tabletop game and people are using miniatures and you decide that you're going to have a battle in town, you can dig out your old Warhammer train and set up an entire town on the table or have it set aside so that in five minutes you can give them something neat and they'll remember that entire encounter differently than they would 
a little bit of a piece of whiteboard. Yep. Um, but you need to have all that stuff ready for yourself. I picked that one especially for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I, 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 the three of us, I'm the prop GM. So. Oh, I know. I know. I picked that one especially. But I know, like, but I know this, right? Like, I don't do this. Um, I, I don't really, I don't really game with props. But um, improving with props is can be done. But for like a big set piece encounter, it really is nice to be able to be like, okay, slide this onto the table or uncover it and be like, all right jump in, like, put your characters here. This is the setup. Boom, boom. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, right. today, and today with things like roll 20, it's, it's just as much of um, trying oh. to grab, trying to grab maps ahead of time. I always try to grab six or seven extra maps ahead of time. And I have, I've finally gotten down to where um, I pull tokens for all what I think are going to be the bad guys this week and at least put them aside a little bit so that when we get into something, we can use it. Um, Thank you. Thank you yes. for mentioning that. Cause that was also, um, I, I did not. I did not mention virtual tabletops and should have no. when I was writing this. But yes, um, mm -hmm. a little bit of prep helps VTTs immensely. Uh, I just, you know, I'm. Uh, I have. I think tomorrow I have to start getting uh, DCC loaded up yep. um, for uh, our next our next uh, adventure. Although I think, well, I'm not going to give anything away, but yeah. I think I'm I, good. But either I, way, I, I need to resend you the link to all my VTT tokens. Yes, uh, you'll have a ball with those. Um, okay. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, so, so prep. I mean, so we talk about the good things. Of prep. Prep also has some disadvantages. Yeah. First of all, it's going to take time outside the game to complete, and uh, this will determine a lot by just how much you want to prep, uh, which is its own topic. You want to see never unprepared. Um, uh, yeah. You also yeah. want to see. We did a. We did a. Um, uh, episode in the 200s or something all yep. about prepping. Yep. Uh, but it, it takes time. And as, and as some of us get older, we find ourselves with less and less time to spend pouring over games. So. Uh-huh. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, um, you know, prep assumes the players are going to, you know, use the stuff that you prepped. Um, you know, and that's where that meme comes from, right? Like maybe they're not going to use it. Maybe they will, um, but maybe they won't. So that that's you know that's definitely a disadvantage if you prepped a bunch of stuff and they don't use it. Um, now I, we didn't talk about it here, but of course you can recycle that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We talked to you about improv, but uh, the last thing is that if you prep too rigidly, then you don't take account for anything else that comes up during the game. Yes, and that can be a problem if the players decide to do something a little different, like build a cobalt orphanage. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know how players love to surprise people. Yes, they sure. do. It's the way it works. Yep. All right, so that is prep. Tell me about improv. Oh, so what does improv do? First of all, uh, improv is going to allow the GM to steer the game in flight. Uh, but you get good improv skills to start making changes as the game goes and keep it moving. But as I said, it's a skill, which is something that we can improve upon with practice. Um, all of us who are good improv GMs now did start out that way. Nope. And <laughs> And we learn every single week something new that we try, something new that worked, something that we don't want to do again because, oops, that didn't work. Um, but improv in and of itself is going to have a couple of advantages. Yeah, so um, it creates elements, right? Situations, locations, NPCs, all that stuff. It creates them right in the moment. So, you know, if I, if I need, if I need, suddenly I need the constable of the town, uh, I'm going to improv the constable up. You got it. Uh, number two, just as you said, it's going to fill in the gaps that you have in prep. If you happen to know, you know, that they want to go to the to the town to the uh, the bar, and they decide they're going to go over and talk to the washerwoman because they think she's going to have some gossip, you can improvise that right in and give some information there. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to keep the game going. Uh, you're going to avoid what we call dead air, right? Mm -hmm. It's from my days of being on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to avoid that dead air situation. So if all of a sudden you hit a space where uh, the players pick a direction you weren't expecting and you just start improv uh, what you're not doing is stopping and looking something up or, you know, going to grab another book out of your bag because, you know, I, I had prepped the Eastern marches, but now we're going to the Western marches. I need the Western marches book to look something up. You know, you just, you're just going to start improv -ing. Mm -hmm. And you're just gonna, you know, you're gonna just keep the game going, and no one's gonna have to stop. Yep. 
Uh, the next thing is it doesn't use any time outside the game. I got to um, asterisk this one. It uses yeah. a little time outside. It, 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 and we're, <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about that too. Good. Yeah, okay. because, <laughs> because there are ways to use prep mm-hmm. to, to make improv work easier. Yep. Yes, I... I, when, I, when I saw you wrote this down, I'm like, yeah, we're gonna talk about this for a second. It's so, yeah. not exactly true. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but but it, it uses very little time outside the game. Nowhere near as much as it does if you're gonna be prepping. And there are again, there are ways to use prep to balance improv. Yeah, yep. Um, it also allows the game to just go in any direction um, because you're just gonna create. You're just gonna create as you go. So, uh, I you know I've done, I've done really really heavy improv games where. Mm-hmm. You know, I I throw the most bare bones thing on the table, and where we wind up by the end of the you know those hour few hours, you know who knows? Like you know we're all over. You know we we hardly even recognize where we left from. You know, <laughs> we did that at Con in the Cob uh, two years ago when so many GMs had canceled that we had a whole table full of players from different games who didn't have a game to go to, and so we improved a bunch of characters together really quick, and then. Uh, I, while they were writing their stats down, I wrote down notes on a single three by five card and then ran an adventure for four hours. Yeah. With, we were just, where it goes, tell us about the characters and move from there. And it can be a lot of fun. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it took very little prep time. It took longer to put the characters together than it did to actually prep the game. <laughs> uh, uh, but <laughs> it also has some disadvantages. Right. So um, kind of the opposite of what I said for prep, Improv has a higher cognitive load. Yep. Like you're using your brain uh, in the moment. And um, depending on what else you're juggling, uh, that could be a problem. But also I will say this, higher cognitive load does not necessarily mean a bad thing. Um, some people actually enjoy that cognitive load. I am actually one of those people. I love the improv uh, part of a game because I love the uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Mm-hmm. when the players say like when the players say what they're going to do and i'm like oh, oh how does this connect to this and how do like where do i go next kind of thing i actually like that but mm-hmm. um and i can say this with i'll say this with some confidence as a you know gm approaching his 40th year of gming yep. oh okay <laughs> as a GM, that some of those other eight skills i can also go easy on and let like and let a good portion of my brain work on improv stuff mm-hmm. So, yep. cool. Uh, what else? What are, what are some of the other things? Uh, it is uh, harder to do things that require more continuity. Yes. You're going to run mysteries, conspiracies, long-running campaigns, things that have to do with history. Um, it can be much harder. No, I said harder. It's not impossible. It just means that it's going to be more difficult. And you may have to fall back on some of that uh, of, of the prep side to keep a game going properly, especially if you're doing something with a mystery or with a twisty turny political Jason Bourne star style adventure for a long time. Yeah, it's the continuity part that's going to be hard because when you're improving, when you're improving, you're just, you know, kind of blurting out the stuff that, you know, like that you're throwing out there. But you also, in a mystery, have to make sure that the stuff you're spontaneously creating fits the stuff that you've all like that fits the stuff that's already out there. And I've played improv mysteries where at the end, like there's a great game for this, right? Noirlandia is a fantastic game um, and it's an improv mystery, but there's a moment in Noirlandia where you have to kind of look at the clues that you spontaneously gathered and then figure out how to stitch them into the mystery. And that's a very different feel than there's a mystery where we know what's going on and, you know, pieces are getting revealed and you assemble the pieces and you're like, aha, I see what happened here as opposed mm-hmm. to, okay, here's what, here's some things that we know that happened. Let's tell a story of how these all fit. Yep. And they're, they're very, they're just different feeling and, and they can just be a preference. It's not well, a, one's well, not what, better than the other. Well, one of the trickiest parts about improv mysteries is to make sure that you don't give out red herrings oh you know because that because because we all know that especially in a mystery the players will latch on to anything that isn't actually the, the clue so um yeah. it yeah, just I, happens i mean we could have a whole sidebar on no red herrings I, no. i'm not a red herring guy in, yeah, in I'm not play games. Nope. all right okay keep going um 
improv will pull you towards your comfort zone. Uh, you actually have to work pretty hard when improving to stay out of your comfort zone. Because when you are assembling things on the fly, when you are pattern matching, when you are synthesizing things, uh, you tend to go with the things where you make fast connections and you make fast connections because they're things that are familiar to you. So they wind up inside your comfort zone, right? And so you sometimes have to actively fight these. Like I know for me, um, I know for me that if I, so I'll give, I'll give two examples. If I improv weather, it's always sunny and like 70 something degrees, right? I never bother thinking about weather in my comfort zone is always like, yeah, the weather's fine. Um, whereas if I prep, I might specifically say something like, it's rainy because I have this image in my mind of what I want, you know, a scene to look like. The other one, which I actively fight, is that my comfort place for describing NPCs is I make them male. Yeah. And so I, I work very hard, even especially, especially when I'm improv I work very hard that before I say the gender of a character that, you know, I like in my head, like, how many, like, you know, I, like, if, if you're about to say male, maybe you shouldn't, right? And I, like, try to switch it up. And sometimes I say male, but, you know, then I try to, like, work really hard for, it, you know, to be um, not not a dude. Um, and that's the comfort zone problem, right? That's the comfort zone. It's the, and, and for me, that comfort zone is unfortunately established by, you know, um, you know, the generation we grew up in. So right. there is this thing where I work very hard to fight that. Now in prep, it's a lot easier because when I'm prepping something, um, I can actually be very conscious of what I'm doing, right? Because I have time on my side in this case where I can say, okay, um, you know, let me check really quick. I have seven guild masters. I better not have made seven dudes here, yeah. right? You know, better yet, maybe I'll only make two dudes and let me see what else. Let me let me let me create some other characters. Very easy to do uh, when you prep. Harder to fight your comfort zone when you're doing improv. It actually is um, a thing you have to actively engage. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And the last disadvantage is that it's often harder to use with some table elements. Minis, terrain. Again, harder, not impossible. Um, one of the things I do when I'm doing tabletop games is I will just always have a long card box with some assorted minis in there and um you know i'll have a couple of hobgoblins and some soldiers and some elves and dwarves and just stuff stored out if i have some idea of what i think the adventure is going to be this week i may toss all the things in there but that's what i'm going to use and that's what i'm going to improv with and whatever i've got in that box that's what they're going to encounter if they decide to throw down with somebody um, if i need if i need to put something on the table same thing with with terrain i've got a lot of uh, i always keep a half dozen um the old pathfinder flip maps kind of folded up off the table so that if they end up going somewhere and i need a map real quick this is what it looks like and i'll just yeah. improv it off there and that's partial prep but and we're going to talk about that in a second so yeah but it's really good in that yeah so it's a, like a little bit of prep um it's a little bit of what's in your toolbox like i know like um john arcadian who's a very big improv gm mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if he still does it but one of his past tools which i always thought was brilliant was um he had a um a uh, bag of Jenga tower parts. Yep. And when he needed to uh, improv a structure, oh, a structure, literally anything, need a bridge, need a structure, like he would just grab a bunch of Jenga pieces and put them yep. down yep. and be like, okay, yep. this is what that area looks like. Yep. Um, and it was, you know, so again, it's, um, it's not impossible to do these things with table, with table props. It is just a little bit harder. I actually just got something today that just came from Drive Through Cards called the Hyper Halflings Treasure Hoard. It's just a set of cards with random, um, undefined treasure on them. Not things like a plus one magic sword, things like uh, a fused chain circlet with a trapezoidal orange gem. And uh, there's eight on a card, and it's good. And what I'll do is, before I run a game, is I'll draw five or six cards and just stick them under my keyboard in front of me. And if the player's decide to pick somebody's pocket or go to a store looking for something or whatever, I'll just pull one of these out and read something off. And yeah, I think those from there. I think those um, tools are fantastic, right? Yeah, like yeah, I, I, love I, I, tools. I yeah. love, I love tools that kind of randomize stuff. The cipher deck from Numenera. Yep. The, like I, I like all of those things. And you just build it from there. Uh, 
And one of the advantages that gives you is that um, I've got this odd little item and it's undefined. So it can be whatever we need. And more importantly, it can be whatever the players really want or need right now. If they've been talking for a while about, oh, I wish we had A, B, or C, you can give them one of those as this really mild magic item or whatever. Um, and make it make it you know make it work. So um, those are things that you can do to play with your table elements while still being improv. So cool. All anyway, right. So that's uh, that's a good look at improv. Now yep. let's talk about putting them together. Yeah, this is the let's get the chocolate and peanut butter. Yeah, right? baby. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. All right. So do it, Jer. All right. So I'm gonna put my chocolate anyway. Um, anyway, it isn't both at the same time. <laughs> so going back to our original premise, uh, these are two things that can and should be used together. And the concept's pretty simple. You prep some portion of your game, and you're going to improv the rest. Right. And here's the secret, right? All RPGs have some element of improv in them. I, I don't care if you prep everything for your game. I don't care if you run a published adventure. I don't care if you wrote your entire, like, four-hour session. You can't actually prep. For what the like for everything the players do in a game, and so at some point in every game, a GM is improvising something. Yep. Yep. And what we want to do then is calibrate how much prep a GM needs, so that the rest can be improv. And there's a possible approach. God, there's lots of them. They can be used to balance some prep with some improv. Yeah. So uh, you know, we're not prescribing anything here, but we're just going to kind of give an example of how like you might set the needle. Right. Mm -hmm. Like between your, you know, if we're talking about a continuum of, you know, all prep and all improv, where do you want to put your needle? Um, so you could, for instance, you could prep a situation, right? What is it that the characters are going to do? Um, you might prep a few notes about um, I, I do this all the time. This is actually my secret. Right. So I'll prep the situation. And then the other thing I will do is I will write myself like a few notes on what happens if the players don't do anything as if yep. if the players weren't here, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And what that tells me is I know what the outcome is that the players are eventually going to like, are going to interfere with. Um, and that helps me understand uh, not only the shape of the story, but it under, like helps me understand what the NPCs might be trying, like what else the NPCs might try to do to get to that same point. Mm -hmm. um, might throw together some critical NPCs. Uh, depending on how cool I am about dialoguing, and if I'm doing things like giving clues or something, I might want to put some dialogue, a few bullets of dialogue down, maybe some clues. Mm -hmm. Might want to do a little outline of possible scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I know I'm going to wind up using some weird rules, and I say this all the time, right? So if you're going to be fighting on an icy bridge over a river, you might want to have the rules for swimming and drowning yep. nearby because... Again, I don't want that dead air thing where I have to go look them up. So I might just take those and throw those in my notes as well. Yep. So that's what I would prep. I want to talk back real quick. I think one of the things that, that, that taught me at an early age to do um, what happens if the players do nothing was a series of games put out in their very early 80s called The Companions. And each adventure was written um, where the players come to town either knowing they're coming there to solve a mystery or just stumbling into something. And they gave you a timeline of what happened before they got there, what's going to happen over the next four or five days, and what are the events that are going to occur if the players don't stop them. Yeah. And that's, how, that, that, that's something that you always want to prepare for because, you know, you prepare your dungeon and the players decide to spend two weeks building a cobalt orphanage. Well, what's going on with the evil wizard while they're building that, with that orphanage? There are yeah. consequences for all mm -hmm. actions. Yep. And if you want to build the cobalt orphanage, that's totally cool, but also right. The you know the evil cleric has been has had had two extra weeks to raise an army of undead. That's right. So you better train those kobolds to fight. Get those All kobold right. orphans battle ready. <laughs> All right. So here's some uh, some examples of things you really shouldn't prep too heavily. Uh, the first is a solution to the problems at hand. Amen. That that's going to be up to the players to come up with, and. It's where I like my improv within reason. Give them, give them a problem, let them come to the solution. However, and I'm going to caveat this, as the GM, if you're going to put a problem in front of the players, you should have at least some idea of a way that they would be able to solve it. Be careful. You don't want to put that in front of them as the only solution. But I've played it in games 
where the GM left the solution entirely up to the players. The players had obviously no idea where to go next because they didn't have any clues or how to solve the problem. And it's obvious the GM doesn't know how to solve the problem either. They've created a problem they can't do. Um, I've also had been in a game where the players gave up because they didn't have a solution. Nothing yeah. was obvious. They're like, you know what? We have no idea. We're packing up our horses. We're leaving town. I guess the dragon wins wins this one. <laughs> and yeah, and, and it's also important. A, yeah, so there's a number of things that can go wrong here, right? So yeah. like for, the first one is that the gym, you know, thinks that they gave enough information to the problem. They didn't, and the players misunderstand everything. Yep. Um, the other one, though, is, and I think that would put this a little on the GM laziness side, is if you create a problem and you don't contemplate the solution, yep. you like you said, you may have made a problem that cannot be solved. Well, at least um, that's solved by the players that by the players with the resources they have. Yeah, like it doesn't yeah. hurt. Um, yeah. And I'm with you, right? Like I will, like, I will, when I'm prepping like a scene, I might be like, okay, you know, there's this, um, there's this difficult trader uh, who has information, right? And then I'll put underneath it, like, if you bribe him, he's going to want about this much money. Yep. Right. But for all I know, the players are going to be like, you know what, we're going to hang him over, like, we're going to hang him over the cliff and get our information out of him. That's right. Okay. Well, I don't, you know, like, cool that's another like that's a valid solution to this problem so right. let's let's play that off from there but but you're right like what i yeah. what i normally do is i kind of think of i'll tell you my evolution of thought when i was a younger gm yep. i would create the problem and then i would create the solution mm -hmm. and then i would basically and this was a skill i was really good at i could in the way that i gave information back to the players based on skill roles, based on how I described things in the room, I could telegraph the players to jump onto that solution. Yep. I was really good at it. Like I was so good at it, like that it was a very, very subtle skill that I'm glad that I no longer use, but I was able to, to do that. And so what I do now is I'm not beholden to the solution. I put the most likely solution in my prep, and then I just leave it alone. And uh, it's if, basically, it basically the sent, the line I don't put on the end of the sentence is they can bribe, they can bribe the guy, comma, or anything else that seems reasonable in the time of the game. But when I wrote uh, the first adventure I did for Dark City Games when I worked for them, we had an encounter that that required um some level of of thinking and skill. And in the actual description, I gave the GM some notes. If they try this, this, or this, they could do these things. Every playtest group that did it did none of those things. <laughs> right. It's, it still worked, but, but and that's okay. But you want to have a solution. Um, last, last year, I played a game uh, with a mystery, and we literally ran down all of the suspects we knew of and figured out that none of them were the person. And we stood around for a week just trying to find new suspects because we yeah, didn't know where to go. No and, that, and, and that's frustrating in a game. Yeah. Um, so you want to make sure that you, that you keep it moving forward like that. So the next thing is, but you don't want to prep all the NPCs that aren't important. Just you don't need to prep all of them ahead of time. Um, now, if you're bad at names, have a list of names available. It's something you can prep for. Um, but you don't need to have the name of the bartender's daughter's boyfriend. You can, if the, if that becomes important, you can make it up on the fly. Yes. Uh, you don't have to prep the weather. Um, there are simple weather generation things. Um, years ago, a GM taught me. That for weather, we just roll 2d6. If it's 5, 6, or 7, it's clear. The closer you get to 12, the hotter and drier it is. The closer you get to 2, the wetter or colder or whatever it is. And um, and if it's below 6, you take minus 1 off next uh, off tomorrow's roll and vice versa. And it made it easy to keep consistent weather from day to day, but also just roll randomly for something. Oh, we had a thunderstorm today. Let That's actually a clever, a clever way to handle it. Yeah. I yeah. like that. I, I used to have in my Iron Heroes game, my um, way of dealing with weather was that all the major uh, regions yeah. had a sister region on Earth. And okay. I would just look up the weather that day for That's that cool. region. So, like, if you were in for Bob, if you were in Manitoba, I would look up the weather for, you know, someplace in Morocco. Okay. Right. And like that would be the. Like that would be the the corresponding location, and if you were in, you know, Kokala, with you know, then I looked up some like I looked up um, something in Finland, 
And that, and that's how I like, that's how I basically would just be like, cool, Google, what's the weather in Finland today? You know, like, and it would give me some, you know, like, oh, it's raining and cold. And I'd be like, well, it's raining and cold. And I just rated it. Yep. And that yeah. works. You just move that thing right along. Um, the other thing we don't prep, don't prep other dialogue. You don't need to have every single uh, clue and hint in there. You don't need to prep the room descriptions um, because the players may not go to the rooms you want and they may be looking to notice something different. And depending on what happens with the plot, there may be something that they want to look at. So, mm -hmm. um, And remember, you can always prep for improv and you can always improv your prep. Um, so blend them together and take the parts that you think uh, you need to have and get them set up ahead of time. Yeah, and, you know, the idea with this approach is, now, again, those were just our suggestions. You may be like, no, no, I need to prep the weather, and yeah. I don't, you know, yeah. whatever. It's okay. It's okay. This was, that was just a, it was a suggested framework. But the idea behind it is that um, with that approach, you are setting things up, but then you're letting the game and the play of the game figure out how they're going to resolve. So it accounts for things that are important right, that you need to make sure you pass on to the players, clues, um, how, you know, those kinds of things, um, the things that might likely come up based on, you know, predictable actions of your players. But then it, it just lets go of everything else and, you know, lets, you know, just relies on the GM to, to create what's needed as it's needed. So why is this a good idea? Well, the reason is you want to have a balanced approach. Is prep-heavy games need the players to stay on track, and they don't handle deviations or surprises very well. Um, but we know players don't always stay on, pla on plan, especially when you've got players who have developed detailed characters with intricate relationships with each other in the world around them. They tend to find their own motivations for things. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, improv games need a GM and players with energy and high creativity to volley the GM with ideas to keep the game going forward. And groups can just have low energy nights. Uh, I know that there have been nights when I've asked the table, okay, you, you know, you walk into the bar, what do you see there? Um, uh, it's just some drinks. Like, okay, great. Right. We know we're going with this. Uh, time to pull some things out. Yep. Um, and taking time to prep some of the game lowers the cognitive load, load of the game, but allowing you to improv the higher cognitive fun that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So if you've got things down, like the name of the tavern, the person that's there, you know, the basic plot, um, you can improv as you go. Exactly. So there are some risks to this blended approach, right? Um, you're going to do some prep outside the game, meaning you got to have some time to do it and you got to go sit and do it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes the problem is one of those. Sometimes it's the other. Sometimes it's both, right? Motivation, availability, and the merging of both of those. Um, some of the material you prep may not get used depending on which way the players go. So, um, you know, sometimes you just recycle this, right? Like, so if no one used this particular trap or this encounter, you just, you know, tuck that away and you're going to use, you know, just cut and paste it into your next adventure kind of thing. That's fine. Sometimes you're just going to junk it. Um, it doesn't mean that it's wasted, right? I think this is a thing I fight all the time is that, um, and I've, I, I, we didn't say it in this in this episode so far, so I'll say it here, right? Is that um, prep is the thing that makes you comfortable enough to want to go run the game. Yep. And you might need very little of it. You might need a lot of it. But the goal is still the same. You want to be confident enough to go in, sit down, and run your game. Yep. So, you know, sometimes that means you're going to prep stuff that doesn't get used. My biggest thing is not so much that I don't prep stuff that's getting used. But what I prep, I I have never mastered writing what I need for how much time I'm running. Yeah. I inevitably write more stuff that I need than I will get through in a session. Right. And and I could likely cut my prep, but I never feel comfortable doing it. I'm always like, no, I gotta write out at least this much of the adventure. And then we never get through that much of the adventure. But then the next week I go to prep and I'm like, oh, well, I already wrote this half. Like, eh, I'll just take it out this much further. And then I'm, yep. you know, so, and eventually like one, some week during the campaign, I'm like, basically I like open up my prep and I'm like, oh, I don't have to write anything this week. Like nope. <laughs> <laughs> we, this is the end of the adventure and we never got to this. So 
yeah, I, I'm probably, and we'll talk about it more when we get to the round table about our own prep styles. But yeah, I mean, I, my biggest risk part of this is I tend to put more prep of uh, more stuff in than it's actually going to get run. But at the same time, it's probably going to get run later unless I go back and like tweak it along the way. Yep. Okay. All right. So we've looked at prep and improv as tools. And we've talked about as a blended, the blended approach of using both the strengths and weaknesses that this going to uh, have. So let's go take a break here and check with the chat room. But first, Bob, tell us about another show on the Respect Mark Network. All right. We're going to talk about Zhang Yu Hustle. Train alongside fellow students Eric Farmer and Eli Kurtz in Zhang Yu Hustle. Eric and Eli make their kung fu stronger by watching, watching wuxia films and then discussing how to apply their observations to game design. Wuxia. And we are responsible for that show being in existence. Because yes, because it was it was the world's worst episode on martial arts. Yep. <laughs> I you know what I'm gonna stand by that. I think that may be one of the best things one of the best things we've ever done on the oh, yeah. show is possibly have sparked those guys to go make a show. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yep. So in the chat room, um we've had a couple of comments, a couple of interesting comments. Um uh, Professor Fox said that yes. sometimes you think you've thought of all the different ways a party can break into the mansion and then they go and knock on the front door. So yes. it's like you, you, you're, you're going to end up improv because guess what? They did not follow any of the prescribed methods of breaking in that you thought of. And, and nor, and nor for your own sanity and free time, do you want to sit and brainstorm every possible yeah. way? Like if you're like, okay, if they're going to break in, here's like the five most likely ways to break in down the chimney, through the skylight, the back porch, whatever. And maybe you got to take a few notes about those. But if you sit around and are like, okay, what else could they do? Could they knock on the front door? Like you'll madness lies down that yeah. road. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. So you really need to have a couple of ideas again, because you're prepping to make yourself comfortable to run the session. So if you're like, I yep. can't go in here and be like, you're going to break into the mansion. Go like, I can't, I can't, I need, I need at least something written down for mm -hmm. some possible way they might do it. Then fine. Throw a couple of ideas on the thing, but then they're probably going to pick something that you didn't think of. And then you yeah, just and, go with it. Yeah. And it but, gets, and it gets harder if the game. So if a game has high level magic, Oh, yeah. Like your chances of like your chances of 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 pinning down what they're going to do is very difficult, right? Because they'll just you know maybe they're going to scry and teleport. Maybe one of them like maybe one of them's going to turn into their animal form that's a cricket and slip through the crack in the wall and like let everyone in. Like you don't know, yeah. you can't like. And if you've got that one group where everybody when they put their heads together they come up with the wildest creative ideas right like they five minutes and they're like well we're gonna do this and it's like this convoluted uh rube goldberg plan but it's like whoa okay <laughs> you're not gonna be able to forecast that no no and again so you know yeah it's exactly that right like you just no matter how much you prep you're going to have to be prepared for some improv. Yep. Um, and uh, no matter how much you improv, you probably benefit from some prep. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely down with that. Mm -hmm. How about what else the chat room got going? Uh, Bude said that once they devised the misdirected Mark word scramble, they yes. devised a diabolical trap, then put the solution written plainly on a prop that was handed out to the players was pointed out to the players repeatedly. They each looked at it, and then everybody overlooked the answer. <laughs> it, so, you know, we talked about this in the mystery episode a while ago, oh. right? Like, the clues are never... Yeah. Clues are never as clear to the players as they are to the GM, right? Like, the GM's like, what is wrong with all of you? And the players are like, what? What? And then you point to it, and they're like, oh, I thought that meant something else. Yeah. Right, like, well, like I've, I've I've talked before about the the superhero game that I ran where I laid all the clues out and the players while I was in the bathroom the players drew a flow chart 
connecting all of the clues to entirely the wrong people <laughs> and decided that an entirely different villain was running that was running the show and that was what they were going to focus on for the rest of the game. It just and, and then, Yeah, and then you're like, okay, well, all right, let's do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's just, like, it, those kinds of things, like, you have to, like, uh, yeah, if you think that something you've created is airtight, like, there's no way the players will miss this. Yeah. Nothing is ever airtight. They will players. miss this. Right? Yeah. Oh, and uh, there's a PS. One of the players accidentally bumbled into the solution just trying to be a troll. It was like Dr. Jones Sr. rocking back the chair to open the secret exit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it, it, I mean it, it. and it's those things about... Um, I, there's there's tricks to prepping those kinds of things so that um how you present them and like what the players do has a higher chance of success um but yeah those things are, i mean that's the danger of all mystery games right the danger of and this is the thing that um i both love and is dangerous about gumshoe which is uh gumshoe just hands you all of the clues right basically the mechanics for getting clues are really easy yeah what the game relies on is for you to put the clues together to come up with something from it. Yeah. And, and that, um, you know, there's that, um, there's that meme. It shows up on TikTok all the time, but it's from friends with um, Phoebe trying to teach Joey French. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Where yeah. she's like, je ma pelle. Right. And like, you know, he's like, Je m'appelle. She's like, okay, put it together. And he's like, fuh, 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 fuh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just totally can't get it. Right. It, and, and that's and that's and that is the best analogy at times of being a GM for mysteries for players is like yep. you've placed all these like clues out, and then you're like, okay, now all you have to do is put these all together, and here's the mystery. And they put them together like all wrong and are like, ta-da, and you're like, shit. <laughs> Come on, it's like a yeah. jigsaw puzzle. And the picture is going to be the face of the vampire you need to kill. Why does it look like a giraffe? It's a Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. We've talked about this. Phil knows giraffes are dangerous. That's right. <laughs> I got respect for giraffes. Mad now. respect I, I, for I, giraffes. I spoke, I spoke a lot of smack about giraffes for a long time. There you go. I won't mm -hmm. do that anymore. All right. Back in for the second segment. Yes. And in this part, we're going to talk about our own approaches to prep and improv and GMing. And we're going to start with the following question, Phil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the sliding scale of uh, all prep to all improv, um, where do you naturally fall as a GM? And then I also asked Bob, because I know you haven't GMed in a while, but where you think you might want to fall. Jer? Um, I'm heavy improv with some prep. I'd say uh, on, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, I'm probably uh seven improv three prep i do a little bit of prep uh but most of my prep involves um writing down some notes ahead of time um right now because i'm running a a, a savage worlds game i'll pull out some maps and stuff like that and have them ready um and i'm a big fan of charts and tables and stuff things from like those cards resources like the dungeon dozen or your whisper and homunculus where you can find charts and tables things and just uh I have a whole binder full of just random tables for things that I'll sometimes roll on just before the game starts, just to give myself some, if the players decide to go left, this is what they're going to encounter and have it somewhat available for them. And then I'll worry about how that fits into the adventure from improv. But yeah, I'd say probably I'm like a two or three prep and then like a seven or eight improv. Bob or uh, Phil? You know, for me, it's, this is like a, I want to say that I am somewhere in the middle, but it also will depend on the game a little, right? The game yes. will kind of skew me one direction or another. Um, I like I like to prep things. I mean, I mean, all things aside, right? I when I taught myself how to improv games, I made myself not prep things for a long time. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I like I actually like prepping stuff. I don't take a long time to do it, but um, I do reserve a little time in my week to kind of organize my games and give them like a little simple prep. Um, so uh, I, I, I mean, my method is pretty much the one we outlined, which is um, I like to come up with uh, what will the players be doing? 
and not heavily concerned about how they're going to get the job done. I feel like that's a thing we'll work out once we get into the game, but I like to have some idea of what um, is going to go on for the evening so that I kind of know what I can kind of slide out in front of everybody. So I'm I'm pretty balanced. And then, like I said, if we're going to play mystery or um, or conspiracy, then I'm going to be more prep uh, and a little less improv. And if we're going to play something like PBTA, then I'm going to slide to a little less prep uh, and a little more improv because I'm going to lean a little more on the game because the game will make those things happen for me. But right now, like I'm playing a lot of, um, I guess what I consider fit, like kind of traditional games, right? Like um, Forbidden Lands and DCC and Numenera. Uh, and I'm for those, I'm taking a really balanced approach. Bit of prep, bit of improv. How about you, Bob? So looking back on my past GME experience, um, I was very much for a long time a heavy prepper. Um, at one point, I, I would consider myself a doomsday prepper. Like, I prepped hard, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like, there was a lot of prep. Um, but in between, sprinkled in there, I would, I would like, surprise myself with the improv. Um, my 4E game that we played for a year was heavy prep because I did a lot of battle mats, uh, battle maps, um, tokens for monsters and players. So I had a whole bunch of that stuff going in and I was running, uh, the, the, the pre, uh, written modules from Watsi. Um, so I was pulling all of the, all of the, the, the table stuff, uh, to do for that. So there was a lot of prep going on with that, but and Phil knows this because I made the cardinal sin <laughs> where there were games where it was like, yeah, I I totally didn't have time to to put anything together with for, for tonight, so I'm just kind of winging it. Like, mm-hmm. never tell them that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you would say it like, you know, oh, uh, you know, like, yeah. you were like, it was like, what you were doing was like, you were trying to like set expectations like, well, if this game isn't good, it's because I made it up and I yeah. didn't, you know, doomsday prep it. Yeah. But I, I think if I'm going to armchair psychologist here for a second, I think that that doomsday prepping, right, is the sign of what was it going to take for you to be comfortable GMing? And GMing is like really not your jam. No, it hasn't. No, it right. hasn't been. Yeah. So I think like, like that excessive prepping was like your way of trying to kind of combat that feeling. Yeah. I had a, such a high threshold for where I thought I would be comfortable with it that um, I just, I just prepped and prepped and prepped and prepped. And that got me into trouble because it took so much time that I would be like, Oh, I don't want to prep because it takes so much time. And yep. then I would procrastinate, and then I'd get to a session, and I'd be like, I didn't prep anything. Ah. Right, because, well, right, because, I mean, and this is, and this is the destructive, like, this is how, um, this is how, and I don't know if it happens nowadays, but this is definitely how in the 90, like, in the 80s and 90s, this is how GMs would burn out, yeah. was you would prep a bunch, but you would hate to do the, you would prep a bunch because you weren't comfortable running the game. Then you wouldn't get the prep done completely. So you'd feel bad because you now just internally let yourself down. Then you show up to the game. Your confidence is kind of already rocked before you get behind the screen. Yep. It's a hit and miss, whether you have a good session or not. And, you know, in your head, if you wind up having a good session, then you're like, shoo, like I escaped, you know, like, shoo, I, I guess I got by. And if you didn't, you're like, well, see, I didn't do the prep. I blah, blah, blah. I suck. Like, like, and you know, boom, the downward spiral. Yep, exactly. Uh, And and the problem partially is that, you know, our eighties and nineties games didn't do a great job of assisting um, the improv parts of the game, right? Like they give you some like loose, ridiculous, um, like loose, mostly useless advice, (laughs) but the mechanics of the game didn't help you. Um, You were kind of on your own. And um, nor did, nor did books teach you how to prep a game. I know because I went and wrote that book um, yeah. <laughs> largely, largely <laughs> out of my fear that I wasn't going to be able to game as my declining time to prep games, you yep. know, was ha- happening in my life because of, you know, family, kids, work, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I get it. Like it, it's a, it's a death spiral yeah. for, uh, for beginning GMs. And, and if you can get 
if you can get better at prep so that you need less of it and you can do it faster and you become more comfortable at improv simultaneously or one after the other, whatever, Mm -hmm. then what you get down to is like, uh, I didn't get to prep the Newman Air game on, I didn't type it out into OneNote until Saturday. Um, I had been kicking the ideas around all week for where I thought the game was going to go. Yeah. And I, I didn't put one of the pieces together until I think Thursday. Like I, there was a thing, one scene where I was like, oh, that's what I want to, like, that's what I want them to see. And then it wasn't even until, su- it wasn't until actually Saturday when I was prepping it that I made like another change to it and was like, oh, this is even better. Yeah. But I'm also in a place where I can be like, my game is on Sunday. I can get this, th- I can, I can get my prep done. As long as I started thinking about it on Monday, I would have to type it till Saturday. Yeah. So, now, and that's a skill. All of that being said, yeah. I have run several sessions where I did heavy improv and the sessions went off well. Yeah. And and they worked. Um some of them were unintentional. Um especially after um after I was told, you know, don't tell us ahead of time that you didn't prep. <laughs> so there were some of them where I finally was like, all right, I'm not going to tell them. But we just did stuff, and, and it worked out okay. Um, and then there are other games. Like, I I ran two years in a row at Gen Con. I ran oh. a Dresden Files uh, one-shot for a bunch of people in our group. Um and that was not the accelerated version, the original Dresden Files State game. The big book. And um and I, I just grabbed one of the one of the 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 free uh adventures that they had with some pre gen characters and I threw it down on the table for a bunch of people. And yeah, there was there was prep there, but I um I just kind of like, you know, went with the characters and what they were doing and, and just, you know, kind of winged it for the most part. So I need so I need to apologize. Past present Phil is going to apologize on behalf of past Phil to past Bob in the present. <laughs> it's very complicated. Um, so here's the thing: that thing about "don't tell us that you prepped" was a bias back in the day that a good GM had to prep. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So our like. Our like our group, which was like you know that I, that time when you were running was pre forge, right? That was like pre forge before like there was before the reverse happened and there was a huge stigma about prep. Our group had a huge stigma about not prepping, uh-huh. um, and and we were wrong, right? Like mm-hmm. I mean, we were wrong. Like you didn't have to prep a game for it to go off well. There are you could improv a game and have it go off well, and so and for the times you did, it, I'm, I'm yeah. you know very happy it worked, and we should have never told you not to tell us. Well, um, honestly, I, I see that as a completely different thing. It's one thing for me to 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 not prep and not be shamed for not prepping, but it's a completely different thing for me to walk up to the table and give you guys an expectation by saying, "Hey, I didn't prep." with like a groan in my voice and stuff like not prepping is one thing telling you guys in advance that I didn't prep in that era was, Mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily the greatest thing to do. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 and that's, I think uh, that's the project confidence, (laughs) right? Like that's the, like if you come in, if you sweat, (laughs) right. Like if you had come in, um, by the way, that was, I don't know if you know this, but never unprepared was not the first name of that book. The original working title of that book was "Never Let Them See You Prep." Yep. Um, but um, that's the project confidence part. Like, if you had walked in and been like, "All right, guys, I'm improving today. This is going to kick some ass." All right, you know, we're going to start with this simple premise and run from there. You're in your ship. The you know alert lights go off. What do you do? Right. That's a very different picture than coming in and being like, "Oh shit, I didn't prep this thing. I hope we don't fuck it up today." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Like. Uh, right. I wonder how I wonder how much improv came up. When I was in college, um, because I was an English major, I had, you know, lots of spare time. And we used to sit up late at night just generating character after character after character, drawing maps, baking sheets, just stuff that never got used, but was available for that. And that's I don't know if that's what you'd call that prepping for improv, 
That is prepping for improv. So prepping for improv is any time that you are uh, preparing building blocks that you might later use to assemble. Like, for instance, a a way to prep for improv is to, like, digest a whole bunch of media about the game you're running. Yeah. Right? So if I'm going to go run Cartel, watching, like, watching Narcos Mm -hmm. is a way to prep for improv because I'm watching scenes and characters and settings and if I'm in the back of my head disassembling those and being like, okay, this is what Cartagena looks like. This is how, you know, this is how a soldier in, you know, this is how a soldier in a, or, you know, drug organization operates as a compared to, you yeah. know, a, a boss, right? right? And then when you go to improvise, you're pulling those things out. So yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Making maps you, you know, maybe or maybe not use, making up monsters that you might not use for this game, but you use it a later game. That's all feeding your creativity. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. So how about question two, Jerry? All right. What are the things that you prep for most in a game? So Phil? Uh, names. Man, I suck at names. <laughs> um, I will never, if, if, if an NPC is important, I will never leave it up to chance to make up a name. Um, plus I always keep a name generator nearby. Uh, the other things, um, I will often outline dialogue if it's something that I need to convey to the players. Uh, like, for instance, in the Numenera game that we just played um, on Sunday, the characters come across this uh, scrapper who's collecting junk uh, out, out, in this, uh, out in this field. And um, he has two things he can tell the players about what like the thing that they're about to do one of them he's going to give them no matter what just talking to them he'll give it to them and one of them he'll give if they make a successful check to befriend them um which they did so he said a whole lot more in that scene but i i prepped those two pieces of information because i was like these are things i need to give to the player right like to the players Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't buy, and I didn't write, I barely wrote a description for this guy, right? That's another one I, I almost never do is descriptions. I just like, like making those up. Um, and, uh, other things I prep, uh, I always prep, I, I like to prep situations and I like to make a little outline of how I think it might go. Yep. But again, I'm not beholden to anything I prep. So, um, I prep and then I'm prepared to let go, but I like a little outline. I like an idea. Like, I think this is how the game is going to go. And then I'm also pleasantly pleased when it doesn't, right? Like it deviates. And I'm like, wow, that is totally not how I would have solved this problem. But kick ass. We made all the roles and it worked. Yep. How about you? What are, uh, what are, what are things that you like to prep? Oh, a whole bunch of stuff. First of all, uh, the aforementioned stat blocks. I like to have stat blocks for the important things that are going to come up. The bad guys, um, any, anything that's going to require some opposition when I have that written down. Um, I've collected, I've got several shelves full of just random tables, decks of shuffled, shuffled cards, things you can just roll on for stuff I expect to have happen, or have ready in place in case the party goes somewhere unexpected. And that's going to depend a lot on the players that I've got. I've got some players that are prone to looking for the weirdest thing they can find in town. So I'm always going to have something shuffled up and ready for them so that when they get to that point, they can do it. Um, I do, to, to answer Evil John's question, um, I don't do a lot of published material, but I'm running Eberron right now, so I'm actually running them through my version of the original module trilogy that they put out. But And so for that, I'm going to go through there. I'm going to pull some of the maps out. I'm going to pull the main themes out um, and then just scrap the rest of it and prep around it. Um, mm-hmm. How I introduce the party to this adventure that they're in now, they're playing Whispers of the Vampire's Blade. Um, how I introduce them to it is totally different than, than, it, than what happens the, in the story. I've changed some of the major NPCs. I've changed some of the major movers and shakers because of who they've done. Um, but that I've all got to have prepped ahead of time. They're about to go. They're about to do the the grand ball part of the adventure, and so I'm going to have a whole list of people they're going to meet there, and that I'm going to prep ahead of time because they're going to meet people there that are going to be setting up plot lines for other adventures. That's the kind of thing I'll prep. But all that's going to be like. A line or two of text, you know, yeah. um, you know, King Panda, you know, Lord of the Podcasts, and he know he you know he knows this, and 
He's going to tell them about this, and that's all I'm going to say. That's it. Just one, two, three. That's all they're going to have. And how that dialogue comes about and how he gets that information out to him determines how it's in there. Um, I. So it's sorry, funny. No. I was just going to contrast with you. So, I, like, I'm running the DCC published adventures for our Thursday game. And um, the way I, like, I run everything out of that adventure. So what I do is I actually... Um, I put the advent I put the PDF of the adventure into an app on my iPad called Goodreader and I use color highlighters and I have three different colors. I have one color for for uh text like box text stuff like yep. stuff I need to read to the player. Uh I have in yellow I highlight the um the rules that are in the description of the room. Okay. Right because the room might like say a whole bunch of things and then it'll be like um, you know, there's a D like DC 15 intelligence check to spot this. So I'll quick highlight that so yep. that like in the scene, when I'm like running it with you guys, I'll look at like quick scan the text and I'll be like, Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. These are the, these are the specifics about the room. And then I have another one for stat blocks. So I highlight the stat block in a color so that I can find it quickly if I'm flipping pages. Mm -hmm. But unlike you, like, I know you're like, you're disassembling those Ebron things and running it. Like I'm running those DC DCC things. I'm reading the box text, right? Like mm -hmm. it just is what we're doing for that yeah. game, right? Like but it, some of that has to do with how you're running it. You're you're really running that adventure. And this is not a bad thing, but you're running that adventure. Um and the characters that are in her are kind of like anybody could be in that adventure. Oh, it's our because beer and pretzel game. Because right? our like beer and pretzel game where, yeah. where where the game I'm running is the opposite. I'm running a yes. game that is specifically focused around three characters with very specific personality traits and goals. Yep. And I've scrapped some things because even before, even with any group of characters, it was a dumb adventure because a, a, a dumb encounter because it was D and D 3.5 and they did, they, they're not known for their high quality adventures. Um, I, I the, think I was but, just, I was mentioning it by way of noting, like there's, there are, there are many different ways to attack yes. the published, the published. Um, exactly. Well, that's yeah. what evil John asked about. And sometimes you want to run the thing you need to run the thing almost as written because you need to have that flow from scene one to scene two to scene three because or else it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, my my thing for DCC is I would not be running DCC for us if I had to make my own um if I had to make my own dungeons. I have yeah. two other games that kind of take up most of my time on on you know on Sundays. Yes. And um DCC is the game that I go to hang out and play like smash monsters and play games with you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so my, um, caveat to running DCC was I'm only running, I'm only running published adventures and I'm not doing a damn thing with them. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm playing them, <laughs> I'm Super playing minimal them prep. minimal uh, prep to it. Like I read it, I highlight it. And then when we play, I like can read it right in the game. It is not my pinnacle GMing style, yeah. but I have a lot of fun actually. Oh yeah. I have a lot of fun running that game. Well, it's, with, with this with this one, it's been interesting because I, I ran two modules, and then at the and then I ran a like uh, a segue adventure that was you know uh, something I put together, and some of the players switched and Schmidt joined in at the end of that adventure. So I I improv the entire next adventure because his character kind of we were about to do something different, and his character was based around being in the city. So we did, ran another city adventure that was. But the first two weeks is mostly improv. I had some basic notes on what was going on um, to give them a chance to do some mystery and some uh, some consulting detective work and all that kind of stuff. So we'll use both of them. But I do understand the importance of sometimes you just stick to the adventure. Uh, hey, go ahead. Hey, yeah. Bob, yeah. can you put a pin in a topic that I think we're going to do next week, of course. which is different ways, different ways to use published adventures? Yes. I feel like... I feel like we could have a whole talk about this because oh, yeah. I was about to I was about to open up into a whole other discussion about how I prepped the Tales from the Loop uh, published adventures, mm -hmm. and now I recognize that that is just that is just a whole That's other a topic. topic ready to emerge. Ding, yeah. and ding, last, it is. And the last thing that I'll prep for is I will prep specifically to design for leading questions and player driven solutions. I will have spots that I will set out in the game specifically for. Here's a beat where I want the players to put their input in. I want, I'm going to ask a bunch of leading questions here. Mm. Um, even if it's an adventure that I'm doing on the fly, I still plan to have a spot to simply stop whatever narrative I'm doing or slow it down 
and give the players a chance to be the players. Because sometimes when you're doing a story, you're so involved with writing that story, you don't give the characters a chance to at least be as a GM. Don't always give the characters a chance to flex their own personality muscles. And if you, if I put in little spaces ahead of time, that okay, after this encounter, do this and ask the leading questions, it'll give the players a chance to reestablish their role playing. And because I'm running Savage Worlds, that's what I give the player agent more Betty's back. Um, but I'll do things like, I'll just figure out like, what happens when the, when the heroes solve the problem? I don't care how they're going to solve it. I'm just going to say, what happens next? And give them a spot to do that. And for me, at least, that gives me a pacing space to have my high beats and low beats without having just a constant just running adventure. So... And I and I love those leading questions, right? Like those I those leading questions. those leading questions are so much uh, they're so much fun. They can they can create entirely new adventures. Yep. All right, Bob. Yeah. So um, my during my GMing days, I kind of fell right into the sweet spot of uh, of the gist of the show tonight is kind of a blend, um, leaning more towards the prep for the most part because I did a lot of. Um, uh, um, players on a map, uh, yep. characters on a map type stuff. So I had, you know, battle maps and, and tokens and stuff like that. Um, so that would be the thing that I would mostly focus on. Um, and names, I'm a name person. So I would, I would look up names ahead of time and have a list of names, um, that I could scratch off on the fly. Like, Oh, I need a name for this joker. Okay. Boom. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I am, I am so bad at names. And uh, and the also the other thing that I would do is uh, if there was an important rule that that I needed to make sure I would always try and make sure that there was some kind of uh, of, of like summary of the rule for myself to look at. <clears throat> yeah, I like I like those too, right? I, I mean, the advent of cutting and pasting has, has allowed yeah. me to to jam that stuff right into my OneNote page. Exactly. All right, so moving on for question three. Yeah, yeah. What are the things that you improv the most in a game, Jerry? Oh, dialogue, encounters, the things they look for. Um, sometimes entire adventures if they decide to head off in a different direction. Um, and and we, we've had that happen. Um, whatever, I'll, I'll improv whatever is necessary to keep the players entertained and keep the story going. And so um, I happen to enjoy coming up with names. Whenever I sit down to run any adventure in the back of my brain, I think to myself, okay, what are the naming conventions for the major species of the game and the major cultures? So that when somebody comes up and they suddenly say, okay, we need a name for a, you know, um, uh, a, a halfling merchant. And I'll come up with, okay, well, that's going to be... Um, He'll be Longfoot or something. And I just rattle that right off the way. I need to write that down, obviously, because they're going to ask that again. Uh, but that I don't really, I love improvising names and things like that. Um, the players sometimes get upset with me because I come up with names that are a little bit hard, hard to pronounce. Um, but um, yeah, I'll just improvise almost anything that, that isn't concrete. Um, and I'll sometimes improvise whole encounters and stories if they decide they're going to knock on the door instead of breaking in and they're going to talk to the uh, butler. Well, that's an encounter. We're just going to wing the entire thing. And I'll try to pepper it with some information for them, but that's it. And part of doing that is you constantly, if you're an improv GM, at least for me as an improv GM, I'm constantly taking notes during the game. Because what you improv now becomes part of the, now becomes an established thing. So, and then you build on it later. Phil? Yeah, um, so the thing I love to improv is uh, descriptions. I like never, um, I never detail out in any length the descriptions of buildings, rooms, things like that. Um, I don't know what it is about it. Like I just dig doing it on the fly, and um, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about it, but it, it's a thing I love doing, and I will never like. I will. I will quick jot some notes down, like this room is large, there's this important thing in the center of it or whatever. And then like, when we get to the game, I'm like, and it's made of these like really interesting tiles that, you know, depict religious, you know, iconography on them. And they were rain. like, I don't know where that came from. Like it just, you know, it just comes out in the middle of the game. So I, I love improv descriptions and things like that. Um, I will, um, 
I, I'm the same thing. I, I do not, I do not prep dialogue that is non-essential. Um, if I know what the general attitude of the NPC is, if I make up their um, either their attitude, their goal, or whatever, then I can handle the rest of the dialogue myself. Like I have no problem. I'll just dive in and um, like chat away. Uh, I find that to also be fun. Uh, other things that I improv. Uh, again, uh, I'm all about um, leaving things open for solutions. So what I really like to do is I like to improv what the mechanical thing you'll need to do to line up your solution. Right. So if you're telling me like, oh, we're going to um, you're going to hang them off the cliff kind of thing, you know, then like in my head, I'm like, OK, well, it's like they're going to make this level of check or there needs to be this difficulty or uh, you know what? They're going to need to make um, a stealth before they can make the grab, you know, something like that. Um, I, I love doing that, like kind of on the fly, figuring out like what mechanical boxes do you need to check to do the thing that you just said you're going to do? Uh, how about you, Bob? Yeah, so definitely like random NPCs, dialogue. Um, those are like really the, the the two heavy things that I would do. Um, going forward, if I ever GM again, I'll probably do things like, uh, I'll probably improv weather and, and some of the other, uh, things that we've discussed earlier, but that's, uh, it's probably about it for me. Mm -hmm. and I'd like to add in here before we move on that. If, yeah. If, uh, I've talked about this before earlier in the thing. If you are a improv GM, the tools available today, let me back to if you're an imp if you're a, a a GM that wants to do more improv, and you're from the older generation like some of us here, um, the tools available today for improv are just amazing. Oh, absolutely! There, there are lots of things out there, uh, paper minis, um, the virtual table stuff stuff that's out there. Um, some of the Patreons. I belong to a couple of Patreons that are uh, paper minis, and almost all of them now are giving us free um, virtual tabletop stuff along with that. So uh, uh, there are companies out there that you can get inexpensive tokens from, um, tables, charts, cards, generic maps, the amount of uh, free to use stuff that's out there in the world to pull up. Um, yep. Even things like Dungeon, du I, I have a subscription to Dungeon in a Box, and every month they give us a map and some tokens and an adventure, and the adventure always includes the first four pages are just random encounters for that theme that week like this time this week it's city of the gods so it's things you find in city of the gods and then there are going to be a couple of random role play encounters later on and we'll talk that's going to come in the next week's discussion but um if you are a gm and you feel like you want to do more with improv while still doing some prep um first of all jump into our forum and ask some questions yeah but also but also understand that there are lots of tools out there that um that we all still use i mean we we may have been gming for uh collectively over a century um but uh the fact is that um we all still use these tools and uh every improv gm i know finds one that they can use and there's a lot of good stuff out there for you yeah and you it allows you to go ahead yeah so you ahead, mentioned Bob. uh cards is one of the things that you mentioned um, there are so many different decks of cards that you can buy now yeah. that are just clue things or triggers yeah. to help you come up with something on the fly. Backstory cards for for oh, how yes. how people are connected. Um, it's not my fault. Yep. Oh, I love them. That, it's not those my those cards are great. Um, there are um, there's a, a company, and now I'm I'm blanking on the doggone name. But they have this these decks of dungeon discovery cards and sci-fi discovery cards, which are like those. random items, random creatures that you run into, random yep. people that you run into. There's so many different decks of cards that you can get. And a lot of them you can get the electronic versions in PDF yep. where you can just sit there and do a random lookup or a roll on a table or whatever. And they're so great for just that little spark of inspiration to help you get over the hump of, of I need a thing here mm -hmm. and I didn't have it prepped or it, even if you're doing some prep mm -hmm. and you want a little help, those things yeah, are great tools. And, um, and if, and I, if you, and if you run a game that has stat blocks, almost every game company out there has car, stat block cards 
Um, yep. There's a there's a, a thing on uh, Drive Through Cards called Cast of Characters for Savage Worlds, and there have got to be thirty different decks of cards yep. for everything. Um, Genesis has all the stuff for Star Wars and Android and um, uh, Gen- uh, uh, Terra, and that means you don't have to prep all that stuff. If the players suddenly if the players suddenly turn the corner and now they're talking to a droid merchant, you can pull out generic merchant. There, there's what you need right there, and just roll with it. Yep, so, good stuff. Um, uh, I'm also going to mention um, just for uh, so I'm going to mention two ga- two books, right? Uh, one, I'm going to just one last time pimp Never Unprepared, right? Yeah. So if you want to yes. if you want to work on your prep side, yes. right? Um, I'm going to recommend Never Unprepared. If you want to work on your improv side, then uh, Evil Hats uh, Improv for Gamers by Karen Twelves is um, a great oh. way yes, to bump one. up your improv skills. Yeah. So. Um, really, you can really you can go and get sources of information about both of these, um, you know, both and you know both both techniques, uh, as well as everything you guys said. Like I like yeah. uh, the book of names is another one if you want mm-hmm. um, if you want random names. Um, I, I I love all that stuff, yeah. um, and I wind up collecting a bunch of those decks and <laughs> charts and stuff like that, and I will occasionally insert them into various games. Oh, yeah. um, and because these are learned skills. Um, using these tools for some period of time will also help you grow that skill to be able to do it on your own yeah. on the fly um, without having the tools. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to, we've got a special opportunity because we've got a new person in the chat room. Sure. And we're going to take advantage of that when we hit the break. So I'm going to get us in there real quick. Um, that is our discussion about prep and improv. Yep. We hope that um, as you think about your own jamming style, that some of this advice will help you out and that uh, you will use both tools uh, to make your games awesome. All right. Let's do one last check in with the chat room and then we're off the conversation corner. All right. So in the chat room tonight, we have a, a new person, Karlowski, who. Um, has given us a glorious opportunity. Uh, they mentioned earlier in the chat room that they're struggling with prep versus improv because they're running a homebrew open world tabletop. Awesome. And they're just personally yeah. thinking to just have a list of creatures at the ready because they want to be ready with encounters and stuff because if it's open world, players are going to explore and they're going to sure. find adventure. Yep. So, um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Um, we have so much knowledge that we can drop on you. Um <laughs> Uh, is there anything in particular that you would say right out of the gate, Phil or Jerry? Um, oh, God. Uh, go ahead, Phil. You take this one first. All right. So, I, I mean, I really like the encounter lists. Um, I think I think that having um, either a deck or, um, you know, just, I mean, if you go back to, like, really old school, like, uh, BX and, like, 1E gaming, right? Like, um, they used to make encounter tables for uh, each of the different... Um, uh, types of land that you were in, right? Like if, mm-hmm. if you were in a forest, right? They had a, uh, and and not only that, I think they also had them by level, right? They had like low level encounters, mid level encounters, high level. Like they had a lot of tables, kind of mix and like ma- mix and mashing up all those monsters to be like, okay, well, if you're a you know sixth level party and you're in a desert role, right? This is the encounter you get. Yep. I think those things are great um, uh, because you know it, it just offloads from the GM what the encounter is going to be. But then I also say at the same time, you want to have a ready source to have the stat blocks for those encounters. Yep. So um, if you're going to make your table, put the page numbers to where the monster stats are, right? Yes. So that when you roll it up and you're like, uh, cool, you're attacked by, I don't know, a, a griffin, <laughs> right? You can just be like, cool. And they're just going to immediately open the griffin, yeah, like stat yep. block. Because yep. that's that dead air thing. Um, I would also say um, that there are that uh, making up your own stat block cards for a few things are useful. Um, mm-hmm. And also, um, next week's show is going to have a whole bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. How do you do that? Uh, Pre published stuff is, is a great way. But um, just because you have an open world uh, doesn't mean the players are going to be completely. Uh, open to just do whatever they want whenever they want and you will still have some control over that and one of the things you can do is use things like weather and terrain and that 
to give you the time to put the adventures you need in their way. Um, because players will give you some idea of what they want to do. Unless you've just got a group of completely chaotic neutral people who are just running around at random. <laughs> um, and, and and there are players who do this just to mess with the story. Yep. But you can always figure out what their what their adventure hooks are. Um, I've talked before. I ran a Warhammer game where all the players decided that their goal for the campaign, regardless of what I was going to do, was they were going to go find the lost Bugman's Brewery and, and find the, the last set of Dwarven Bugman's beer. And so I knew that whatever they did, if I kept giving them little hints of where it was, I could steer them back on track. And so finding out what the player's motivation, what the character's motivations are, and the player's motivations, will give you some help on uh, doing open world stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, to, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, random encounters don't necessarily always have to be random either. Yeah. Yep. You're if you're in a sandboxy type of campaign, and you're like, okay, they're gonna go, they're moving in this direction. I know they're gonna go into this particular hex, or they have a choice of like these three hexes that they're gonna hit in the next session. Mm -hmm. You yep. can be like, hey, that hex over there, that one's gonna have. Um, a couple of possible random encounters, but there's also going to be like a bugbear lair, um, a cave with a with a with a small dragon in it, and um, and then a caravan that is um, actually a bunch of ghouls traveling at night in the disguise of a caravan. Like yeah. you can plan a set adventure piece or encounter, and then use that as part of the random encounters, and be like, oh, so you're going in this hex. All right, so it's going to be one of these three things. If mm -hmm. you hit that first encounter, or you're going to hit at least one of these, regardless of whether or not we have a random encounter, that kind of thing. So you can seed yourself with some stuff. So the game that has a really good um, model for this is Forbidden Lands, right? So Forbidden Lands looks at, so Forbidden Lands as a heavy focus on travel, yep. right? And it's also a bit sandboxy in that uh, it gives you a map uh, with most of it not labeled. Uh, and then it gives you a whole bunch of um, places that have labels. And the game actually gives you stickers so that the GM can be like, this city is here. Yep. And just stick it on the map where they feel like it. But what they do that's really good is that um, Forbidden Lands identifies uh, two different things. There are encounters, and they're random. Like, they have a whole chapter of their book uh, and their random encounters are actually more than just a um, more than just a monster. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes they're like really weird encounters, like the insulting orc. Yep. Um, yeah. Like it, like it's an actual encounter where the players came upon this um, this orc whose job it was to um, they wanted to hurl insults at people, um, and I forget what the motivation was. It was pretty funny actually. Yeah. Um, but the players like just like they randomly came across him twice and then Bob killed him. Um, he got what yeah. he, Oh, he wanted to see true anger or something. So we would insult people till they got truly angry and then Bob killed him. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that they have is adventure sites. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they're like, okay, this is an adventure site, be it a town, be it a dungeon or whatever. And you place it in, like it gives you a whole bunch of detail about it and like stuff that's going on in the town or whatever. But it's up to you to decide where in the sandbox you're going to place it. Yeah. And so between those two things of having set piece adventure sites with things to do mm -hmm. and having random encounters for when you're traveling between adventure sites, yeah. um, you basically like you have everything you need to, to run the game. The other thing I will say in an open world sandbox is um, players can't go everywhere. Yeah, I mean, players are bound by whatever method of travel they have. So you really don't have to have, if they're like, you know, riding horses, you only have to have like a certain ring of space done yep. to deal with them before the next session. Now, if they've gotten their hands on like fancy air travel or teleporters or stuff, you have a bigger, you have a bigger uh, scope problem on your hands. But like in my... um in in our um uh forbidden lands game uh if you look at the number of actual hexes the players have been in compared to the map it's pretty small yeah. like 
they've traveled in like in a certain area. Mm -hmm. They haven't gone like all over that world because they're like they were on foot forever. Yeah. And now they're like on horse, and that's only marginally faster. Yeah. I like I like to put a couple other things in here. Random encounter tables are interesting, but you know what? Go through them and pick the what pick the ones out that you think are interesting. You don't have to say roll. If you know they're gonna be going in either a forest hex or a desert hex or a um an ocean hex, go through your encounter tables for there and say, okay, what are the three most interesting things on the desert hex? And just pick those yep. and have them you know and, and do a little prep for them. Um I like uh, the 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 uh, Professor Fox came out with her advice was that to have a team rocket miner bad guy who can also run uh, run into the plot <laughs> whenever you need it. That's a great idea because it'll it'll first of all provide continuity for your game. <clears throat> and lastly, um, don't be afraid to to slow them down a little bit. Have recurring NPCs. Um, Give the you know have the things that you like whatever it is that you think is interesting, um, put them in. He's yes, and his chromatic chameleon said, make them seem random. Roll dice, and they still encounter the bugbear there that Bob thought was cool. Uh -huh. Because bugbears are cool. I mean, that's just a thing. Secondly, the lizard men. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and and we're gonna talk about this next week. Steal from other sources. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, I ran last year or for for two years. I ran. A completely sandbox game where we we randomly generated the world, randomly generated the species, randomly generated the cultures, and then I had to build a game off that. And for that, we just used a lot of tables, and I did a lot of um, just having source books available. So I would say, first of all, definitely tune in the next week's uh, podcast because yeah. we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of tools that will come out of this. Um, but steal yep. from the things you like. Okay. All right. We good? Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Yep. And All right. It's time to slide into the conversation corner, kids. Yep. Boom, 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 boom. Hey. All right. Conversation corner time. Jerry, what's been going on, man? Well, the shelves at the kitchen were a success. Um, because I'm in an essential industry, I did not end up doing any working from home this entire pandemic. Uh, I was back at work that Monday, and, and I've been there the entire time. But uh, I was supposed to take a three-day training class uh, on a new Legion All licensing uh, uh, license, basically, that's coming out. And they had to cancel it because uh, Illinois became a no-fly zone for New York State. And... Um, so now it all went online. And so to make sure that I can actually pay attention to it, um, I've actually been working from home for the last two days and I will be doing it again tomorrow. Um, I still get dressed up every day, put on my polo, put on my, my, my I wear shorts instead of, instead of long pants, but. Rookie. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, because, because it's all live and because sometimes I'm being asked to actually uh, talk about some things. Um, but it's been fun. It's been long. I mean, I normally spend long days at the office, but this is, nine hours sitting in front of the computer just studying and everything. And I haven't yeah. studied for an exam. I haven't studied for an exam in 20 years. So um, on top of that, we had our, our, our next Savage Eberron game this past uh, weekend with uh, Chris and Bridget and Schmitty. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, last session ended with them completely going off, off a script for how to deal with the encounter. So I had to rewrite the encounter for this week, which went very well. Um, and uh, They've been having a lot of fun. They're very good at solving mysteries. So mysteries I put out there generally don't make it to the how many clues are there thing. They generally find out, figure it out by clue two or three. Um, I watched Joker for it finally. And uh, I think Joker, the movie with Joaquin Phoenix, is a perfectly serviceable, the dangers of what happens when you take away people's uh, meds movie. I think as a movie about the Joker, it's horrible. But I think as a movie, as an interesting mental health movie, it's interesting. Um, I finished Star Girl, which I think had uh, one of the Bob also watched the last episode of Star Girl, and uh, one of uh, an amazing um, super team versus super team throwdown, um, better than anything you saw in uh, Justice League. Uh, watched the beginning of Lovecraft Country, which has been an excellent show, and if you have HBO, I strongly recommend it. And uh, lastly. After Bob and I've been talking about movies and watching a bunch of stuff, I figured out that standard Jason Statham is a type of movie now. 
uh, because we watch, I watched Safe, and it was a perfectly good movie, but it's that middle-of-the-road Jason Statham movie. You kind of know what you're going to get out of it. And if people ask you about types of movies, a standard Jason Statham movie is going to kind of give you, not the high-end yeah. stuff, but, and there's nothing wrong with it. It was a good movie, but that's, a, yeah, no, that's definitely a genre. It makes perfect sense. There's going to be some cool fighting, right? Like, there's going to be some tough guy talking, right? It's like, a very particular kind of fighting and talking. It's yes, a, yes, yes, yes. Big it's, sweet. It's, Big spooky yeah. things, and it's it's not going to be like a like a standard Jackie Chan movie or a standard no uh, no, no Mark Wahlberg action film. So yeah, you've right. got it nailed down to a right. It's so that's perfect. my thing. So Bob, yeah. So sports are weird without fans. Uh, over the past week, I've watched a bunch of hockey games and a little bit of baseball, and both of those sports um, are uh, playing games in stadiums that are empty. That have the hockey rinks have the seats covered up in the bowl. Yeah, I like that actually. The baseball stadiums actually, a lot of them are having um, cardboard stand ups of fans. That's weird. To make it look like there's people there. Um, that's, that's just weird. It's, it's interesting. Um, the hockey has been, it's like they have a, uh, the, the, like the organist has like a, um, a soundboard. And when something interesting happens, like they're hitting a thing with some canned crowd noise or like, you know, like some clapping and some stuff like that. And then they've uh, pulled in from each team's uh, home rink. They've pulled in some of the sound effects that they play um, when goals are scored and stuff like that. So that they're they're making some they're they're manufacturing some excitement other than just having a bunch of stuff happening. Um, and, and like there's no other noise. <laughs> Because otherwise it would be pretty quiet. Um, they need they need to have the baseball games on the hollow deck. Yeah, there you go. Just just like the Niners. Yeah. Oh, that's a little teaser for yeah. uh, future DS Nine watchers. Big big casting. That's yeah, actually not uh, in the list. It's been uh, it's been <laughs> interesting. Um, that said, uh, as Evil John mentioned, um, <laughs> the quality of hockey <laughs> that I've been watching has been pretty damn good. Um, it started out a little rough because teams hadn't played in so long. They, 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 essentially, it's playoff time, but instead of doing the playoffs like they normally would, um, because the season was cut short, they had like a qualifying tournament where certain teams below a certain threshold um, were playing um, um, like a round-robin tournament, um, and then certain yep. other teams were just playing to see who would get in. Um, so they had a little starting thing, and then once that was all decided, and, the, and the, there's like, I don't know, 24 teams in the playoffs or something stupid like that. Um, then after that, they eliminated a bunch of people. Then they had the actual first round, which is happening right now. Um, so a little interesting. Um, cool. We had our session zero for uh, Quest uh, on Friday night, where um, uh, Jared Rasher... Um, is putting together a game using the quest rules, um, but we're using the Eberron setting as our location for the game. Um, and we're playing a bunch of intrepid reporter type people and associated uh, cohorts for a newspaper in Sharn. Um, and that nice. looks like it's going to be interesting. Um, um, that was two Fridays ago, actually. No, it was Thursday. I'm sorry. <coughs> Thursday night we did that, and then Friday night we had Jared's Streets of Avalon game, which we had another wild episode um, with a lot of wild stuff going on. Um, but one of the things that really stood out from this episode was we're using the gritty rules for um, recovery. So instead of short rest is an hour, long rest is eight hours, short rest is eight hours, long rest is seven days. Oof. Oh, so if you run out of spells and you and you need healing and you used up all your um, all your um, your uh, uh, dice, your, uh, your hit dice, um, yeah. you've got to go seven days before you replenish some of that stuff. Luckily, when we hit periods, where we're like, OK, we're going to have some downtime. Um, it's kind of interesting that we're like in the middle of this thing where we're trying to track down some evil happenings that are going on in the undercity. Um, and then it's like, okay, we're taking 10 days off, which seems a little anachronistic to, we've got a threat that's looming, but we're going to kick back for 10 days. Um, but it's to. working so far. 
Yeah, I I would have trouble with that because as somebody likes to play spellcasters, uh, not be not being able to cast spells but once every seven days would be a problem. Uh, it uh, depends yeah. on the Luckily, mechanics of the game. Spells re, re, yeah. A lot of the spell stuff replenishes with a short rest. Okay, but um, but yeah, it's the hit dice. Like we got we got a little low, and that makes you do things like, oh, I'm gonna buy a healing potion from the apothecary, and well, the healing potion that I got is not quite a hundred percent perfected. So, you know, make a con save. Oh shit, I failed it. Well, you feel sick and you barf up this little insect creature. And that insect creature just happened to roll off into town and spawn more insect creatures and then they all grew up and took on your face and ran around doing things in your name. <laughs> and now all the griffins are looking for you to arrest you for doing this bad thing. And people are telling stories about this guy that can't be killed because he keeps popping up, and it's just wackiness. So that's an Avalon game. But yeah, it's an Avalon game, and it's a lot of fun. So yep. that's cool. Ooh. Phil, what about you? Uh, let's see. So I talked about Numenera. Um, uh, my bike. Uh, so I think last week I talked about you know taking uh, putting my bike together and riding for the first time in twenty plus years. Uh, and I think I remember being pretty hard on it about like, it, it, it's like riding a bike isn't exactly true. It turns out you just need a little time. Um, it is actually like riding a bike. <laughs> I'm much more after a week of riding, I am, I am doing much better. Um, but I immediately, uh, fixed a few things this week. I ordered myself a new bike seat, uh, and I ordered some spacers to go in my pedals to move my pedals out a bit. I got wide feet. I needed. I wanted to make sure I had a little room from away from the pedal arm, but really the seat. So the seat that came with the bike was not good. It was also not good for a number one. It was cheap because it was you know it's a low end. It's an entry level bike, Um, but the seat you know is is not anything they're going to spend any cash on. I'm a I'm a big guy, right? I'm six two, three fifty. That seat was tiny and kind of um, poked me in places, <laughs> um, which made riding uncomfortable. So um, so I quickly Googled uh, bike seats for big dudes and found like a hundred, like I immediately found recommendation for this great seat. I ordered it right away. I got it like Wednesday um, and installed it and changed everything about the bike. Like, as soon as I sat down on the seat, I was like, this was a very good decision. Like, I I was hesitant to spend, I spent, I think it was like 300 on the bike, I spent 50 on the seat, and I was a little like, oh, should I really be spending this much money on, like, a bike that I haven't really ridden that much? The answer was yes. Like, as soon as I put the seat on and sat down on it, I was like, oh, I could now ride this bike for a while. Like, this is, like, it is no longer poking me in, in uncomfortable places. So, um, and I did, I just, I've been riding it every day and I've been like just going out further and further each day and to, like getting my stamina up on it. So I'm really happy uh, about how that's going. Um, I'm watching Voyager I'm in season, I'm coming up on the end of season two Voyager, which is I coming up on the end of the, the episode that Bob um, lost his shit on when we watched it live back in the day. I'm going to watch it with new eyes and see if it really is as bad as I think it was. Um, which episode is that? Uh, it's the one where they lose the ship. Okay. There's some thoughts that a captain should go down with their ship um, and that, you know, they should have torched that thing and left it like a burning streak in space. But I, <laughs> yeah, I, um, <laughs> um, but there's arguments for that. The running uh, I'm gonna joke go, is, I, is that Janeway lets her ship go more times in that series than every other captain in Starfleet combined. See, I I, I gotta go but look because I, I don't know if that's that true or not. Times. Right, it it definitely <laughs> happens at the end of season two. The Kazon storyline has um has them losing the ship. Um, but I need to go back and watch it because again, I'm watching it with fresh yeah. eyes. Um, I will say this: as I was putting together the DS9 list and watching Voyager, like one, I know that DS9 is my favorite uh, Star yeah. Trek without cool. a doubt. Two. I can definitely tell the difference between the serialized structure of DS9 and the episodic um, parts of Voyager because I'm able to skip, like, like in terms of making the list, I'm able to skip through all these episodes and then I get to the ones that are part of, like, the meta arc and I'm like, oh, this is a good one. 
like, oh, this one has to do with the Kazon. This is good. Like, this is a, like, this is any of the ones that have anything of a semblance of a story arc are the ones I've been drawn to. And likewise, I could only eliminate 40 episodes from Deep Space Nine. I mean, and that was me working pretty hard about mm-hmm. like, like things I could get rid of. And I like, I, it just couldn't do it. Like DS, yeah. like there's so much. And I, in my notes for DS9, I'm like, simply one of the best episodes of DS9 ever. Yeah. <laughs> just There's like four places where I have written like one of the best episodes of this entire series. Oh. Um, and, uh, and then I went the, um, the other thing I did was on Saturday night before I jumped online with you guys, I went back and watched um, a particular episode of DS9. It is, in my opinion, the queerest episode of DS9. Um, that is in there um, called Chimera. It's a season seven episode and it is super queer. Um, although I preface it by saying it's super queer because when I watched it, I was like, Oh, these are all like, this is all like, you know, like queer coded themes and stuff like that. And I think for a lot of people, they may or may not get that in watching it. But for me, I was like, I was like, Oh man, this like, it's this heartbreak, heartbreaking queer story, like stuck in like in it. It's one of the rare uh, single episodes, and it could have been one I could have taken out of the DS9 list, but I was like, fuck no, we're all watching the queerest yep. one. We're watching <laughs> it for a watch party, too. We yep. should. <laughs> like, it's, I'm pretty sure it's on the watch party list. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, so anyway, um, I've been doing a lot of DS9. Um, have I been really doing anything else? No. I, I've kind of fallen off Minecraft. Like We got to what I think we've reached the end of our season the co-op idea was interesting but also we blew through all the um mods in the game in fact we blew through the stuff we blew through the game so quickly we actually skipped a bunch of mods like we didn't do anything with those chocobo birds because like within like within a couple like within a week we were all flying i don't think i i I was never planning on doing with the chocobo birds they were, as far as I was concerned, they were just a ready source of food and <laughs> and and feathers. That was really about it. But like the tech packs, like we we barely had to, we barely even had to cut into the tech packs. It's um, mm-hmm. I, I I don't dislike playing Minecraft, but like I know when we're at the end of us, uh, when we're like towards the end of a season because everybody stops playing, yeah. And we're definitely there because I pop into I pop into Mumble and hardly anyone's playing, and if they are, yep. they're playing other games. Yeah. I even went and started my own single instance. So um, we probably will need to regroup and um, consider mm-hmm. what we want to do next with the game. I've, you know, proposed some ideas um, about some, you know, other ways we could play it. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to play PVP or anything, but there's, yeah. there's this really hard mod pack that we could get the server mm-hmm. pack for. Um, yep. and, and we could try it. It would definitely require us all to work together. Um, because the mod pack's fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one I raged quit. Yeah. Um yeah. like uh and I'm debating on whether that's a good idea or not because um I did rage quit it and I don't know if that'll be fun for us. It might just be something we do later. I don't know. We may just like whip up a bunch of tech packs and just go back to what we did before where we each just run off like a couple of thousand, you know, a couple of thousand blocks in, in our own directions and then do our thing. And I'd still be interested in this building. Maybe just Bob and I'll team up again because we always seem to have a good time. Just, but we'll we'll look at how things go. Yeah. Um, did Savannah? Uh, that's Savannah. Did did Santa say Blood Moon? She did. Ugh. Yes, I've already terrible said no. mod. Terrible there, there will be mod. No Blood Moon. That was the worst idea anybody ever came up with. That's a sadist who came up with that idea. What is Ugh. what is what is the Blood Moon mod? So the Blood Moon, Jerry, is yes. it, it's it's this mod that um, periodically throughout the game. At some set cycle, and you can adjust it. Um, yeah. You'll get a message that says the blood moon is rising, and when the moon starts coming up, everything is red tinged. Yes, and monsters come out of the woodwork at like a bazillion times the normal rate. Plus, they're jacked up. They're jacked up. They're frenzied. It's like Night of the Living Dead, and you can't sleep. You have to go through the night. And yeah, so yeah, you have to yeah. find shelter, otherwise you will get your ass killed. And it's even worse because the one mod pack I played the Blood Moon in um, was uh, Absolute Ender, which had Ender Zoo in it. 
which has like five different um, additional types of creepers. Yeah. And when the blood, the blood moon came out before I learned how to disable it, I spent the night on a rowboat rowing across <laughs> the ocean, <laughs> trying to avoid anything that looked like land or a town for the whole night it was terrifying <laughs> so stupid yeah, i mean it's mean as hell because like i said it, it forces you to stay awake you can't sleep the night away and it's just like okay well uh i guess this is me now standing in a hole or or on top of a you know like a nerd hop or whatever yeah <laughs> and you have to and then even when the day comes now you've got all these mobs it takes time for the ones that die in sunlight to actually die and the ones that don't die in sunlight are still there. And yeah. some of them eventually you're going to despawn, but not all of them. Yep. And so you've still got to deal with that. It's bad. Yeah. It's not fun. It I don't recommend. Do not, do not recommend. Yeah, like a whole night and a whole next day. <laughs> all right. We should probably roll out of here, right? Yeah. Okay. It Head over time. to the after show. All right. Time for the Patreon shout outs. Sounds good. Thank you, Dan <laughs> Simons. David Walker, Donna McCarthy, Drew Smith, Glenn Seiler, Jason Pinella, Jason Pitt, Gene Lorber, Jeff Stevens, and Jim Morrison. And thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. If you are free on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's Time, come join us live on Twitch, where you can listen to us and hang out with the awesome chat room for life. And maybe you want to ask us the occasional question. If you cannot make it to the live to the live show, check out our podcast each week, wherever you get your podcasts. And take a listen to some of the other shows in the Mr. Trek Mark Network, such as Down with D&D, Bone Sword Obsidian, The FM Gamers, Panis Talking Games, The Gnome Cast, John Who Hustle, She's a Super Geek, and Bonus Experience. You can and should also check out our sibling podcasts, Tabletop Bellhop, The Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming and BS. After you have uh, prepped for your next adventure and before you have to make up something because those wacky players went off the off the trail, leave us some feedback. You can reach us directly via email, mmp at misdirectedmark.com. Hit us up on Twitter. The show and the network is at misdirectedmark. He is at Robert M. Everson. He is at GM Gerrymander. And I am, of course, DNA Phil. If you like what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaign. MMP, Down with D&D, and Panda Stocking Games are at Patreon. Mr. Mark, Mark Word, Word Scramble. <laughs> Patreon.com slash MMP. She's a Super Geek is at Patreon.com slash SassGeek. Zhang Hu Hustle is at Patreon.com slash Zhang Hu Hustle. And Bonus Experience is at Patreon.com slash Bonus Experience. Patrons of MMP, Down with D&D, and Panda Stocking Games get access to the after show pre-production show notes, musical parodies, The Pandas Talking Games bonus outtakes, and other special releases. This has been a Mr. Mark production, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Mic drop. Yow.